world. Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 89, Spring Fling AMA. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live, locked down from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, in addition to answering your questions live during the Ask the Bellhop segment, I've got a review of the Fox in the Forest duet, which is a cooperative version of the two-player trick-taking game we reviewed last week. Also, in the Bellhop's Tabletop segment, I've got some more two-player games, including Unlabeled, Coimbra, both versions of the Fox in the Forest, and Medium. Uh, we've got another digital play of Terraforming Mars with one of our patrons, and a couple games of Arboretum. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Or you can hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. This week, we have even more feedback on our topic of the best places to play board game online for free. Up first, James Stovall at Stovall ATL on Twitter writes, Thank you. Helpful review from someone who has only played for, for someone who has only played at Board Game Arena. Hi, oh, you're welcome, James. I hope you've given the other sites a try since uh, hearing about what we thought of each of them. Now, Angela Murray commented on the YouTube version of the discussion to say, thanks for covering this. Side note, you don't have to be a Board Game Arena premium membership in a house where two people are playing at the same time. You just need to have the game started by someone with a premium membership. My buddy has a premium membership, and I noticed the warning about two people on same IP when roommate joined us for games. Well, thanks for the comment, Inch. Uh, that's interesting, because I thought we tried this uh, with you having a premium account and Deanna and I being free, and it didn't work that way, and that's why we got a premium account for it to work out. We'll have to try it again when the account expires, because right now I do have premium, so we can't test this. Yeah, we're not able to currently test it, but I do recall that the very first gift, gift subscription you got yeah. was because Eric was creating games that you and D couldn't both play in. Yeah, that's what I remember too. So I don't, I don't know if I'm remembering wrong, or maybe it's a feature they've changed. Yeah, it could be, could be something that's changed, especially with what's going on right now. True. On the same topic, Mark Whitley writes: "Been on BGA for about a week now. I've enjoyed my time there, but the servers do get a little overloaded mm -hmm. at times." Yeah, thanks for the comment, Mark. Right now, with what's going on in the world, I, I strongly recommend at least getting a one month sub for, um, for Board Game Arena, just to be able to jump the virtual line, as it were. Plus, to be honest, I just think it's worth subbing on Board Game Arena in the first place because it's a service that's worth paying for, and it's so cheap. Yeah, now please note, this endorsement is not sponsored in any way. We just love BGA. Yeah. Now, even as a premium member, I have had some slowdown issues this past week. There's just only so much capacity you can add. Now, continuing with the only online game site topic, Mark Chance writes, So... Which one would you recommend if my wife and I wanted to play a game with a couple we know who was silly enough to leave Texas for the Pacific Northwest? Oh, thanks for the comment, Mark. Uh, my recommendation totally depends on if you want to play real time, all online at once, like maybe having a voice chat going so you're all kind of playing at the same table, like the same virtual table, or if you want to play turn-based, where people just take their turns when they get a chance. If you want real time, the best option by far is Board Game Arena. There, there's no better choice out of those three sites. Now, if you are looking to play turn-based, all three sites have their own merits, uh, which is what we talked about in the show. And I think that decision is best made by finding a game you all want to play together and then finding a site that hosts it. Now, I will admit, if the same game were on all three sites, I generally would lean towards Board Game Arena, especially for new gamers. But if there's a game that's only on Boite de Joux and you all want to play that game together, that's the site I'd recommend. 
Because to be honest, the lack of features on a site like Watazoo only really hurt when you're trying to do that real-time play. Yep. Now, Eric Franklin writes, I'm surprised you didn't cover Brett's Beetlewelt. All right, thanks for the comic, Eric. Now, this now Eric's the one we just mentioned a couple seconds ago who actually introduced me to Board Game Arena back in the day, so I found this a bit ironic in mentioning this. Now, I mentioned this last week. Someone else asked about Brett Spielwelt, and there was a problem with the Brett Spielwelt landing page. If you went to brettspielwelt.com, you couldn't actually log in. Now, if you went to Brett Spielwelt forward slash spiel where games you could but i didn't know that so on the landing page it wasn't working now i'm guessing that had to do with the flood of traffic with what's going on in the world right now they do seem to have fixed the problem but there was no way for us to review the site before we did the episode so again it's on our list to cover this because there is a good chance we're going to return back to this topic just because so many people have asked about other sites that I think it's probably worth our time and yours for us to actually explore some of the other sites it's just a matter of finding the time during the week for us to try them out all right, well, one final comment on gaming online about Board Game Arena specifically. Patron of the, ho of the show, Yuho Rutila, contacted us on the blog to say about Board Game Arena and marking a player as not wanted. It is possible. You go to the player page and click thumbs down. Then BGA says, you are about to give a red thumb. If you confirm, BGA will make sure you don't play at the same table again. This player won't be able to send you a message or speak as a spectator at your table. Right. So, it is indeed possible to avoid certain players at BGA. Well, thanks for the comment, Yuho. Uh, it's good to know. Uh, it makes that ability, um, being premium on Boitezhu even stranger. But to be honest, the whole list of features on Boitezhu is kind of weird. What you get for premium. I, I do think it's important to note in all the time we've used board game arena going on about two years now including well way back if I, I tried it out but didn't stick around but two years regularly playing it with games going constantly like five to eight tables sean even more i've actually so far never had a problem with another player so i've never noticed the need to use it but then again we do play mostly games with friends and not strangers and it's good to know that such a tool is there Absolutely. When when you're when you're just jumping into random games, having that tool available is just as important as an X card or any other safety tool you have at a real table. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know what that is. This one comes from Steve Corngay, who tagged the bellhop to say, "I've started using the Gloomhaven helper for my solo games." I believe at Motuzinho mentioned it using it and how much it helps with game management and table space. I wish it not, wished I had listened much earlier than this week. <laughs> well, thanks for the tag, Stephen. Uh, I got to say, yeah, the Gloomhaven Helper app, the one specifically called Gloomhaven Helper, is really, really solid. It is. Uh, it's greatly improved our enjoyment of the game made our live streams much more interesting. It's easier to track everything. Plus as the added bonus, because we do stream of showing our audience what's going on so they can see our character stats and what monster cards are drawn and stuff like that. So it, it, it's not only made the game more fun to us, it's also made it more fun for other people to watch. So that's huge props to that. We'll drop a link to the Gloomhaven helper in, uh, in the show notes as well as in the chat if anyone does want to check that out. All right, well, Cardinals fan contacted us on Twitter to say, by the way, loved your podcast on Pulsar 2849, another fantastic game. Well, thanks, Cardinals fan. Uh, this one has proven to be a rather popular review, and yeah, it's a fantastic game. And I have yet to have anyone dispute that, so it seems like it's got a pretty universal appeal. Yeah, it's a shame it wasn't, uh, wasn't more popular, because I think a lot more people would really thrill to it. Next up, Todd Kauk has some game recommendations for us based on last week's topic of great six-player games. Okay. Todd writes, Medici, Rise of Augustus, Decrypto, and Time's Up, Title Recall are my favorites. Cool. Well, thanks for the comment, Todd. Uh, I Roman Bingo, I totally forgot about. Rise of Augustus, we call it that because this is a game where you have all these senators in front of you and you're trying to get chariots and stuff and you pull chips out of a bag. So it's very much a bingo mechanic. It's like, oh, does anyone need a senator? Oh, I need a senator. I need a senator. I need a senator. And, and surprisingly, it works really well. It's actually a really solid game. There's a lot more depth to the game than you would think with a basic mechanic is just pulling random things out of a bag. So yeah, that should totally be on the list. I may even go and edit 
If it's in print, I'll probably go and edit the blog post. If it's not, I won't bother because no one's going to be able to get it anyway. Uh, I do dig that game. Now, the other games you mentioned there, I have not personally played. So what we'll do is we we do every time we get some of these recommendations we haven't tried is I'm going to take Todd's games and I'll throw them in the show notes for other people to be able to check them out. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, leave a like, hit a bell, leave a comment. We, like most creators, only grow by your interaction with us. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email newsletter recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new hot deals, podcast episodes, new unboxings, actual plays. Everything we create gets linked there. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, today was another Renegade Game Studio Worldwide Play Day. Uh, It featured the card game Arboretum. During the event, Renegade did this thing where they send out cool global events to people uh, who are playing the game. They can can incorporate into their games. And the other thing to do is rewarding people who take part by offering giveaways and promos. So earlier today, Deanna and I took part in this event and live streamed a two-player game of Arboretum. It's a rather thinky card game. We made sure to get a list of everyone who was in the chat. So everyone who was there, who spoke up, that we knew, who said something. Remember, you got to say something we're there. We got a list. We sent that off to Renegade Games, and they are going to do a draw. It's a worldwide draw, so it's not necessarily someone that's in our chat who will win, but everyone that was there will be entered to win a copy of the Deluxe Edition of Arboretum, which that's actually what we played today, so you got to see just how nice that was. We'll be releasing an edited version of that uh, live play on YouTube tomorrow. All right. Now, next Wednesday, uh, it's going to be May the 6th. So I don't know exactly how they're going to handle things next month. What I was told was they are going to continue Worldwide Play Day because the original event was just for April. For May, they are just going to do what uh, the way they put it was something a little different. So I don't know exactly what that means. I have to assume they're probably going to feature a game. I don't know. I don't know what what exactly they're planning. But if they do keep doing these Wednesday events, we're going to try to continue to take part. So I've had a lot of fun doing it. So has Deanna. And it's given us something for the two of us to play, some direction for our gaming. All right. Well, the next Worldwide Play Day will be May the 6th. And I guess we'll have to wait until then to see how we are going to handle things next month. If we find out before then, we'll be sure to spread the word on social media. Yeah. Good point. All right, one of the great things that's come out of this pandemic, there hasn't been a lot of good things, but there is some, is the number of people stepping up and doing things to help out the community. And this includes the gaming community and various game designers and publishers. A number of them have released free content, free print and plays, free scenarios, free activity books, free coloring sheets, all kinds of neat stuff. There's a growing number of content creators that have been putting out things for games, all aimed at keeping people busy while they're stuck at home. Now, over the last week, Deanna has actually taken the time to build and update a list of all the awesome content that is out there, all this awesome free stuff that the publishers and designers are putting out. And we've got all that over on the blog. You can find this list by going over to tabletopbellhop.com. The list should be pinned to the top of the page, or you can click on 200 plus free PMP games or follow the link that we'll be dropping in the chat room and including in our show notes. Uh, last Friday, according to Pine, Pinecast, we hit 10,000 podcast downloads. That is awesome. That is so that is such an awesome number to see. A huge thank you to everyone who takes the time to download and listen to our episodes. 10,000 is a huge number. One I didn't think we'd hit, possibly ever, especially not this early. I truly hope the show continues to grow and we continue to get new listeners. I hope the next 10,000 comes even quicker than this one did. Most of all, though, thank you all for listening. You are awesome, and we wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you, our listeners and viewers. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. So what are people talking about in the lobby so far today? Well, as Anchi Games pointing out, that new version of Arboretum, the deluxe version, is very shiny. Yes, literally, like holographically shiny. Yep. (laughs) 
it's I, I am surprised it filmed as well as it did. I was really worried with my overhead lights that it was just going to be a massive white reflective cards on the table. Uh, and uh, Danielle was pointing out that they did get the warning about uh, duplicate IP, but it, it did work. So, so they were able to play. Okay. They were able to play. But so they must, a lot they of people are just saying it. it's so affordable. You know, most people are just even before they get warnings already premium members just because it's so cheap. It is. It really is. For what you get, it's, it's ridiculously cheap. Now, for those of you here live today, if you stick around for the Pento Suite After Show, I got a package here to unbox a big FedEx box. I don't know. I don't know dimensions. Two feet by three feet, maybe. A little less than that. One and a half a by three feet. That, but... A lot less than <laughs> that. I don't know dimensions. I got a big box. It feels like there's a couple things in there. It says two tabletop bellhops. We are going to have an unboxing in our after show. So stick around and you can find out what's in that box. Because I honestly have no clue whatsoever. Whatsoever. All right. Are we moving on? Yeah, I think so. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of April, which means it's time for another AMA or Ask Us Anything. Tonight, instead of tacking one of the many questions our fan have written in with, we'll be answering questions live from our chat room. All right, now we're here to answer your gaming game night topics, but I do want this to be an actual AMA. So really, you can ask us anything. If you want to know more about Sean or I or something not game related, feel free to ask. All right, well, we're going to start off today with a chat uh, question we got from Math Guy Dave in our Discord, our patron-only Discord, uh, because he wasn't uh, going to be able to make it tonight. And he wants to know, what are some newish games, because he knows we're not about the new hotness, but what <laughs> are some newish games that you want to try? Uh, the big one was, we were talking about it a little earlier in the show is Tapestry. I would really like to try that game. Uh, it sounds really fascinating. It was its super hot debut. Everyone was talking about the game. It shot up the board game geek rankings really quickly. And it is not what I thought it was going to be, which is why I just didn't rush out and buy it. I, I am not completely sold on the hype and what I've seen that I will love this game or not. So I really want to try it. This is where it, it's hurting that I can't go to the local game store because I would be begging the local store to do a demo night for this game so I could try it out with the caveat that, hey, if I enjoy it, I'm going to buy a copy. Because it looks like the kind of game I like, but I'm just not sure. Because it's not quite the theme I thought it was. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and there's there's so much right now. Uh, one of the interesting ones that I have seen people, uh, I think it's Kickstarter right now, is Canvas. Which is that the painting okay. game of layers where you're, you're layering uh, tra semi-transparent -tra uh, sheets on things to build up a, a beautiful painting. Cool. Uh, I've seen a couple people I know starting that that one looks and like again it's another one of those ones where i don't know if i'd back it because it's a right. little on the artsy side necessarily for me but i'd love to sit down and try it out and see what the mechanics are like given that it is it is an interesting way of presenting a new game um uh, another one i am really hyped to try out and i have no idea if i'll ever be able to is tainted grail which okay. For a long time, people were calling the next Gloomhaven Killer. It, it did ridiculously good on Kickstarter, and everyone at the time was like, "We're gonna do it. We're done. We're this killed. This is gonna kill Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven's not gonna be the number one game anymore. Tainted Grail's gonna beat it as a better legacy game." And it's an Arthurian with fantasy elements, over the top, supposedly much tighter story, miniatures, adventure game, and it looks fantastic. But it was. It's from a company that has done some previous Kickstarter work, and they all do legacy games. Every game they put out is a legacy game. And I gotta admit, it looked really good. But you know what? It's out there. People have it, and I haven't heard much. Now, this could just be because I am behind on podcasts. I'm not totally caught up. But, like, I just heard the Secret Cabal review it. And the Secret Cabal loved it. So it sounds like it promised everything. They said this is the most closest to a fantasy role-playing game that they felt in board game form. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. So this is like the closest D&D &D board game, right? So it gives you that feel of playing an actual, having real choices with real consequences in a board game, which I got to admit, Gloomhaven's not very good at. 
you get a you get a choice when you're walking down the road and then you get a choice when you're in town sometimes and you can't play in character. We've tried with the, with our group of four players where we tend to go certain ways with it, but like you have to come to a group consensus and it's definitely not a role playing field. Cause there's like so many times where you're like, well, I would just do this and that's not an option that's on the sheet. So yeah, tainted grill is a big one. I would love to try, but it's Kickstarter exclusive. Like the odds, of, unless someone in Windsor, I know happened to back it. There's probably no chance I'll get to try that. Right. Uh, and uh, Angie Games is mentioning Call to Adventure is one she wants to uh, try at a public play night. Yeah, that's one uh, Justin owns a copy of that. Local gamer Justin, uh, whose last name totally is skipping my head right now. He owns a copy. He was bringing it out for a while. I've seen it at Easy Mode. I've seen it at CG Realm. I, for something about it, just didn't gra gra grip me. Like, like just, oh, you want to play Call to Adventure? I was like, eh. I guess I don't know, and then I oh you know what I'm gonna go teach this instead. It just didn't catch me, but it did look interesting. It looks like again it has some RPG more character building elements. It does look like a neat game. I'd be willing to try it. Yeah, and I mean it's a, it's an hour long 2.0 wait looks like so you know it's a nice good solid yeah that's not too bad early in the night game not not when when you know still warming up. Yeah, that um, one looked interesting. Yep, yeah. uh, Red Rainbow Ryan is mentioning that. Uh, the thing with Gloomhaven is that it has a, such a strong super fan audience for it. Yes. The Frosthaven Kickstarter hovering around 10 million mark emphasizes this. And it's oh, one it of does. those things there it's, you know, people have commented again about this on Twitter where it's the most, the most famous game people are never going to play. <laughs> <It's>, yes, <laughs> it does happen. You know, so many people have a copy of Gloomhaven that I'm willing to bet they may not even have punched, let alone gotten to the table and, and, and played because yep. it's a daunting task yep. to get that game on the table. No, I agree. Just an example, we were playing last night with John Carney. He's got a copy. He hasn't opened it. It's still in shrink. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of people. And that's why I haven't backed. We don't have a question on that, do we, yet? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that one might pop up. Uh, that's why I haven't backed Frosthaven at this yeah. point. Is is There is still there's so much content in the Gloomhaven box and we're playing semi regularly. We were playing semi regularly like we were doing pretty good and we've been playing since September 2018. And I don't know, like maybe it's really going to rush to the end. It's just going to be like, bang, 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 six more scenarios and suddenly we're done. But it sure doesn't feel like it, like looking at the stickers at the top and the number of things we still have to mark off. And I like I'm it feels like we're only about halfway through that game. Now, maybe well, I'm, I'm mistaken. To be fair, you guys have sort of jumped around a little bit. And you haven't yes. you haven't been rushing towards the end. No, I mean, you, you not have at all. Not said what is the way to the end where there yeah. are groups out there who have just said, boom, we're going through and done. Thank you so much for the Thank subscription, you for the good young. Good young. Uh, All right, do we do we have any other hot games we want to play? Um, those well, are the I'm big ones. I'm still interested in checking out the uh, the potions new new and newer potions game for Harry Potter. That's another one my family would probably. That's the two player, or is that uh, the? No, I got the two player. We have the dueling one. Dueling one is the two player version of Hogwarts Battle. Yep, yep. Uh, but there's also the potions. Uh, I'm trying to remember what that game. And you haven't tried the one that's the the retheme of Thanos Rising either, have you? No, and and that one we kind of, yeah, well, I wasn't sure about whether or not we were going to go with it, just because again, it's yeah. just a retheme of. Uh, yeah. And then there's also the new expansion coming out for Hogwarts Battle, the potions, yep. charms and potions expansion. And then just announced today, they announced a solo mode. Yep, which I printed which if out. You follow me on social media. I dropped the link. Actually, it's, it's on my printer right now. I'm probably going to yeah. give that a try tomorrow. Uh, there's a Harry Potter potions challenge game. Okay. Uh, which is very badly rated, but it only has two ratings. So I, Oh uh, yeah, that's, that. you never know. Yeah, I'm not even going to look at that. Uh, way in the future. Uh, this isn't new hotness yet, but the Prospero hall is putting out a back to the future game. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that. Cause I've well, been really impressed. That far by in the future anymore. Isn't no. it this year? But who knows with yeah. everything going on. Who knows anything is on any schedule right now. And another one that I'm actually going to get to try is the Daily Magic Games, who do the Valeria games, is putting out a dice-driven Valeria game. And just yesterday, I got the confirmation that I am going to get to check that out. I'm going to get to check out a preview copy of that. So that's one I'm looking forward to. Yep. Uh, all right. So uh, from Facebook, we've yep. got uh, someone looking easy games for three to five-year-olds. Three to five year olds. Okay, so first off, we have an episode. I don't remember what it's called. 
might be Three's Company and then some or something, but it's on three-player games to play with a toddler. And I recommend looking at that list. I'm not going to bring it up here. I'm just going to go off my head. But there are a bunch of great games that we played with our kids that were also engaging for adults. So the first one that always comes to mind whenever we talk about toddler games is a game called Monza from Haba Games. And it's a racing game where you're just racing your cars around the track, and the first one to get around the track once wins. But the way you move your cars is there is different colored pattern squares in different colors on the on the board and you roll five d6 that are all those colors on the sides of the d6 and then you have to spend the dice to move on the squares and what's neat about that game is that you can plan ahead like you can look at what colors are coming to go and trying to figure out which colors to use first and some colors are more common than others so there's actually some bits of strategy in there it's not just roll and move it's not just roll a six and see who moves six you move six and you only move four so the person who rolled six is winning it's really good for teaching colors, for teaching pattern recognitions, and that deductive reasoning of, well, what's better if you use the green first and then the red, then the blue, or if you use the green first, then the yellow, then the red, then the blue, you'll get further. So not great for adults, not a ton of fun, but at least there's something there. Like it's it's it got a little more meat than, you know, stakes and ladders, for example, for, for just a race game where you're rolling the die and moving. There is some deduction, but as far as teaching skills, to kids, I think it's fantastic. So that's that's probably my number one recommendation. Another one my kids loved is um, that is fantastic for adults is Animal Upon Animal and all the variations on it, where you have a wooden alligator or crocodile. I don't know which it's supposed to be, and I don't know how to tell the difference. Sorry, I'm not from down south. And you roll a die, and it tells you how many meeple you have to try to put on top. And you take one of your meeple, and you try to stack it on the alligator. And if you get rid of all your animals, you win. If it falls over, you have to take the ones that fell. It's actually the same basic game as hamster roll without the big wheel, It's which I talk about all the time. But the thing with this one is they're nice chunky pieces. And it has the added bonus that a three to five year old is going to play with this game when you're not even there. People are going to just love this game and play with the little wooden animals. So it's, it's a cool game as a game, but it's also a cool toy. It's a cool experience. Along with that was a game called Zimbos or Zimbubos. I forget exactly how it's spelled, but it's like Zimbos. And it's these big chunky wooden blocks that again, you're stacking, trying to get patterns of animals and clowns that again is very much a toy as well, where the kids are going to want to play with just the pieces or play the game. And that's uh, uh, Zimbo, uh, Zimbo's Z-I-M-B-B-O-S apostrophe or uh, exclamation mark. There you go. See, I knew there was like two Bs. So Zimbobos or Zimbos. I wasn't sure exactly how to do it. Uh, Froggy Boggy was another one my kids enjoyed, which was a memory matched with color matching. So there was a little bit more to it. So you had to remember which, which colors of the frogs had little baby frogs underneath them. But there's also a thing where you're rolling two colors. So the frogs are all like divided in half. They're like little frog heads, and you pull their eyes out, which I guess is kind of creepy. And then some of them will have little frogs underneath. And what it is is you'll roll the two dice, so you have to find you have to find the frog that has those two colors, and then you're going to pick one of its two eyes to pull, and one of the eyes is going to let you move, the other isn't. So it's that color matching combined with memory. So again, not great for adults, but you know what? A little more engaging than just you know try to flip over two of the same thing with a bunch of cards in front of you. It's that little step above um goblet jr is a really good one that only plays two players but is basically uh and a better version of tic-tac-toe where you have three sizes of pieces and the bigger ones can gobble go on top of the other so you're just trying to get three in a row but like if you put down your smallest piece your opponent can then put a bigger piece over top of it and kind of capture that square um what Ooh, else? Owl Hoot, it's another one we've mentioned a few times yeah, that's one I haven't played. That um, long time fan of the show, Brian Kurtz, is the one that anytime I talk about kids' games, he brings that one up. I haven't actually tried who would help her. Who, by the time Brian told us about it, my kids were past the toddler age right. and into Kids of Carcassonne and Catan Jr. And, and then uh, La Magic Laundry Labyrinth. Jumble is the one we always recommend that you can't really yes. find anymore. Yeah, Laundry uh, but Jumble. If you can find one. a copy of Laundry Jumble. So that was all coming from episode 59. Freeze Company Kids Edition, which we published about seven months ago. Yeah, it's an older one. But yeah, see, my, my suggestions haven't changed because, well, I haven't bought anything new in that age <laughs> period. That, those are the games my kids love. Uh, there was, um, what was another one? The the Ladybug's Costume Party, or Maskenball de Koffer, which is the German name for it, that uses magnets. And it was really neat because you the, the little ladybugs had little wooden pegs in the back, and it was supposed to represent different colored spots on the back of the ladybugs and what you would do is you would bring two ladybugs together and if they liked each other they would kiss and what it was there were little magnets in them they would pivot 
and they would turn to face each other if they liked each other. And that meant you could swap a color. But if they didn't like each other, they would turn away from each other. So you had to figure out which ladybugs wanted to dance with other ladybugs to try to get a full set of ladybugs with all the same spots. Right. And that was actually, a, it works out, it's a deduction game. It's because eventually you're like, well, the green one doesn't like the yellow one, but the yellow one likes the blue one. So to get this from the green to the yellow, I need to go in this order. And it was really good until my kids solved it. Like eventually they figured right. out that logic puzzle and it was just a matter of, yet they don't like each other. We swap these like each other. We like it. And I'm like, all right, we had to get rid of that one. Cause once, once and, they solved the game, but also uh magnets and little pegs, maybe not for three to five. Yeah. Toddler. Depending yeah, on your, I, depending I think it was age four plus. So right. I, they were, they were, they were like taller. Like I think they were choke proof tags. Right. Uh, so uh, Derek Jones over on Facebook has asked, Games that are easy to play over Discord or similar, but aren't as complex as D&D. &D. Not just okay. RPGs, but things that you could play with family that doesn't have detailed rule sets. All right, this is a topic I think that's gonna might take a full episode at some point because there are so many games you can play online. But some immediate the, the immediate game that came to mind, I don't know why, I'm, I've been obsessed with this game since playing at Queen City Conquest last year, is For the Queen. If you want that role-playing story experience and you go on Discord, someone just has to have the game, which you can get in PDF cheap. Uh, if you use Roll20, which is actually a different way to play games instead of Discord, Roll20, you can get the set of cards for under 10 bucks, which is cheaper than buying the game. And you can play it through Roll20. But if you're stuck on Discord for whatever reason, all someone someone has to have the game. And that could be a matter of just probably buying the PDF, right, to get all the cards. And what this is is a card-driven rpg story experience it's a past the stick storytelling where you start off and you literally read card one and if you were playing the real game you would then pass the deck and that person would read card two and the next person would read card three card four card five and keep passing it well to play over discord just one person would do all the reading and they would sit and they would read the cards off and what it is is you get asked leading questions and it's all about the fact that you're a retinue traveling with a queen to a distant empire and I can't remember if the setup is you're vying for peace or you're vying for war. Like there's obviously, there's a little bit more to the setup. I don't remember off the top of my head. And you're asked questions like, um, what did you do in the past that made the queen angry? And then you answer and you start off like you don't have a character. There's no character sheet. You're just going to answer that question. Just come off with it off the top of your head and be like, oh, um, I made the queen angry because she caught me trying to steal some food from the kitchen. So now I already have this idea in my head that, oh, my character is someone who would steal. Why would I steal? Am I stealing because I'm poor? And so on. And you just keep going around the table, asking leading questions until you get to this one card in the game that comes to a climax of the game. And I don't want to spoil that in case anyone hasn't played it before. But you get to this one card, you ask a final question, everyone answers that, and you're done. Like, if you want that pure role-playing experience, it literally requires nothing but one deck of cards, this one set of questions. You could play that over Skype, Discord, anything. Uh, we also have, again, a full episode of games that don't require contact. Almost all of those would work over Discord with one camera. So you need, so any board game where you don't have your own personal stuff, where, or all you have is your own personal stuff. It goes either way. But the main one I'm thinking for Discord is if everything's on the board. You just need someone with a camera to point it at the board and do all the moves for everyone. Now, I have seen, and I think it would drive me insane, a lot of groups that are using Discord to play Gloomhaven right now. And people have done some really neat stuff where they've taken scraps of paper to put out a coordinate grid along the edge of the hexes. So it just has A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the people on Discord can be like C5 to D8. And then the person who's controlling it just moves the miniature. And they're like, is that where you want to move? Yep, yeah, okay. Um, but then it's all one player doing all the work, right? So you have to know all your cards, but you know what you can honestly, and I don't know how legal this is. You can find all the decks online in PDF format. So I, I'm pretty sure Isaac's probably pretty good with you downloading your character deck from wherever to at least be able to see your cards. And then it's just a matter of you having to keep track of what you have and what you don't have, like what's been played, right? The best way I think to do it would be as if there's some way to take your Gloomhaven and split it up. Like, take your player components home, I take my player components home, Sean takes his player components home, and then I set up the map, and you just play your own cards. But any game with a central board, like, we talked about Robo Rally for that, but again, that's, everyone has to have their own decks. I mean, I would, I would definitely lean into, uh, if, we're, if, we, if we're on the RPG side, uh, pretty much anything Fate or Powered by the Apocalypse. As long as you've mm. got one person who knows the system, 
you can pretty much get through it. Uh, it, it the, the games are so easy to teach and so story based and, 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 you know, but with a couple of six sided dice, um, you know, at most you can generally get through it, uh, yeah. quite easily because again, it's the, it's the game master who needs to know the structure and the, the function. Yeah, for actually, Powered by the Apocalypse, with as long as, like, to be honest, you're not supposed to call out the moves. Yeah. So if you didn't know what your moves were on your play sheet, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, Powered by the Apocalypse is great for pre-gens. There's so many pre-gens yeah. out there. You don't even have to worry about character building if you don't want to, even though, really, that is a lot of the fun of, well, yeah, of building your character those Powered by the Apocalypse. But, you know, you can try it out once and see if people like it, and then... Yep. You know, go back and do the character build again a second time. Now, fate is iffy just because you want to have those aspects. So again, if one person can have a camera, if you've got some way to show the aspects or the sheet. So again, here's where Discord kind of falls down. But you could use a Discord chat. So if you have video with the chat, you can have them all listed. But anything like Fantasy Grounds or Roll20, where you can have basically index cards on the screen so everyone can see it. Or even more so, just open a shared Google Doc. Right. So with Discord, you open up your shared Google Doc and you have on the on the side, you have your Excel or Sheets or Google Sheets uh, open that says, you know, world aspects, um, triggers and all the, all the various different things that are in play for fake games, I think work well. And even to be honest, I think D&D works fine as long as you're not looking at doing maps and miniatures. Like I, I ha would have no problem playing D&D &D 5th edition on Discord. I would not want to play D&D 4th edition on Discord just because of the focus of the rule sets or even Pathfinder because Pathfinder is very much about uh, positioning and grid movement, moving so many squares. But for lighter RPGs, like you can even look up, there's games like Hero Kids, um, Mermaid Adventures from Aloy LaSanta, which just uses D6s. Everyone's going to have D6s, right? All you need is some black and white D6s. And you tell stories about mermaids. Like you're looking for family friendly games. There is no, map there's no miniatures there's none of that required everyone just needs their own character sheet and they're available as pdfs online so you just download each character sheet you go through character generation character generation is just rolling a bunch of charts so the person with the book would sit there and everyone else in the camera would be like okay roll a d8 all right you have purple hair okay roll a d6 okay you have one sibling and so on uh, and, and there are uh, danielle in the chat is mentioning and i think we talked about this on our previous a previous time i just don't know if it was uh in, during the podcast or not but the Descended by the Queen, uh, inspired yeah. by For the Queen uh, decks that are out there. There's quite a, quite a bunch of them. Yeah, there is a, there's a lot of people who have hacked For the Queen yeah. enough that it's now almost a genre of game. There's, there's all kinds, right? Like, it, it depends Fiasco, what you like. Fiasco too. is another one made, uh, Danielle mentioned in the, uh, in the chat room, which is another one. This is, uh, I've started described as living a Coen Brothers movie in under three hours. Yes. Yes, I own a copy of Fiasco. And I'm a Fiasco, it, even more so than For the Queen, requires a lot of improv skills and imagination. Like, at least For the Queen kind of gives you a setting. Whereas Fiasco, like, you're like, all right, you're all at a dance club. And it's like, I don't, to me, it's just a little too yeah, freeform. It, it's a, it's a, probably a bit rough for fa for our family gamers to, to play. Well, that too. Real yeah. gamers, you could probably, uh, you know, if, if, if they were of the right type. Yeah. But uh, family play, maybe not. But yeah, any, almost anything for Fate, Powered by the Apocalypse, a lot of the indie games, just go over to itch.io and you will find a million free games Absolutely. that you can try out. Uh, one plays RPGs. Um, Rocker Boys and Vending Machines from my our friend Phil Vecchione. It's one of my favorite games to play and run now. It's a it's two-sided sheet and you play Cyberpunk. If you know Cyberpunk tropes, you can play this game. If you've ever played Shadowrun, you've ever played Cyberpunk, you've ever read William Gibson or you watch Neuromancer, or not watching Roman or Johnny Mnemonic, you could play this game. It's that simple. Uh, Love and Justice is like the, the Sailor Moon, the magical girl version. There's Lasers and Feelings, which is the original game, which lets you play Star Trek, though it's story Star Trek. <laughs> there, there's, I think there, there's a, something of Force and Darkness or something is the Star Wars hack. Like there's tons of them. Uh, Lady Blackbird is another one that comes strongly recommended without any um, needing to set up again short. Everyone's given a role, really simple D6 system. Um, uh, Cosmic Patrol is one I have downstairs, which lets you play, um, what do you call that? I don't even know the time period. The Flash Gordon, the, the 
rocket punk, the the sci-fi Buck Rogers Flash Gordon era of of over the top. We had a lot of fun playing that system, and all it uses is funky dice. But like all the really dead simple systems were probably what you want, and you probably want to just find family friendly adventures for them, like Lasers and Feelings. I'm pretty sure you can do Star Trek at all age periods because I've been into Star Trek since I was a little kid. Now, one thing I'm interesting, and I think uh rp drive through rpg is definitely missing out on uh if i look at their browse categories i don't see any like they they need to have a category that sort of that people can put their games into that are like you know either dice free or you know limited <laughs> tools they almost need a, a separate category for yeah. this time of age that where you can you know physically distance and play this rpg is uh because there's no the good way to sort that yeah, not not on drive through RPG. To be honest, I'd like I'd sound silly because you're asking us. We're supposed to be the experts, but I almost want to say just Google it, right? Like, there's so many RPG. Like, that's just such a broad question, right? Like, I'm assuming with D and D you want fantasy. That's why I was leaning toward Mermaid Adventures. There's uh, Dungeon World would be the Powered by Apocalypse version of D and D, which would become strongly recommended. Dungeon World would be the one that is the most Dungeon Dragons like, old school Dungeon Dragons. Go into a dungeon, kill some monsters, get some loot. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, Ryan asks, "How are you doing with making a dent in the pile of unplayed games?" <laughs> well, it's not going as well as I had hoped by this point in time in the year. I had hoped to, especially the pile of obligation I had planned to be done before uh, going to Origins for sure, um, and uh, hopefully it was going to be done before breakout. But with the worldwide pandemic, uh, I can only really play two-player games right now, so that is making things a little difficult. Um, there are probably a couple games that I could involve the kids in and play, but those aren't the ones I have to review very much. So it has not been going good. Um, what has happened is I have played a game, couple games off my personal uh, pile of shame, stuff that sat around. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple later in the show, actually. Two games we got off the pile of shame on the weekend. Uh, not a too much else, actually. Um there's goals. There, the, we have a pile of two-player games. The problem is convincing Deanna to play something new. She always wants to sit down and play something she already knows, which <laughs> is fair. So we have to compromise and play something she wants to play, and then I have to convince her to play something new now and then. Like, I really want to get Lord of the... Lord, it's not Lord of the Ring. War of the Ring to the table. That's a big two-player one. I still want to play Julius Caesar. That's another one that just we've had forever. Um, I've got Vikings 677. I think that's a, whatever. It's Vikings. It's from uh, the same people that did the War of 1812 game. Sorry, Invasion of Canada. 18, 1812 Invasion of Canada. It's from the same people who did that. It's a Viking game. I've been itching to play that because we've been watching the Vikings TV show. So we've got that one we want to play. Like So uh, we're getting some. Like I said, there was two two came off my personal pile of shame this weekend. So it is happening. It's the pile of obligation that's hurting for this. And I, I have to assume, I haven't asked permission, but I have to assume publishers are okay with this. There's not much I can do about that. Uh, what I have been doing in the meantime, though, is finding games that are two-player that I can work with. So we did review. We're going to review a game today from Renegade Games, and we reviewed a game last week from Renegade Games because there happens to be a representative from Renegade Games that lives in Windsor, Ontario. And uh, no, we 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 haven't even met. We're just doing porch drops. So I get a, I get a heads up. And it's like, all right, this game's out on my porch, and I drive out to East Windsor and I swap the games I have for the games on their porch. So you know, we're we're doing what we can. Um, it's nice to be able to work with Renegade Games. So at least I'm getting some stuff done. But yeah, there's definitely a pile of stuff that that hasn't been touched. It is shrinking. Like I, I I'm not going to bring it up, but I could bring up the list. It is slowly getting smaller. Out of what's left, though, it's going to be rough. The 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 one I keep thinking we could probably do and give it a fair shake is I have one more expansion for Eminent Domain. But like, I'm sure everyone remembers about six months back, like it was Eminent Domain, Eminent Domain, I mean, that was all we were talking about. We kind of got burnt out on it. So I was like, all right, you know what, we're going to put this away for a while. But I am pretty sure with Deanna and I just playing with Exotica, which is the expansion we haven't reviewed, I'd still be able to give it a fair shake and realize how it would play with more players. Because it's just at that point, I'm adding some more text and some more. It adds a new tech, it adds a new resource, and it adds in some aliens. Like so, I, I think I'd be able to judge how it would play with more players. So that's one. But like, I've got a dexterity game. Deanna hates dexterity games. I'm not going to review that with her. Or I've got that four-player um, Lost Cities game, which we know is terrible two players. So I'm not going to review that. I don't know it's been a little rough. 
because uh, is War is War of the Rings? Uh, sorry, War of the Ring. Yeah. Uh, a obligation or just no? It's yeah. just something I own. Something I've owned for a long time. It was on the bottom of a pile of shame. Get Conan to the table. Yeah, see, that's another one. That's that's again I, that I just moving everything out of the way. <laughs> uh, the one I'm thinking of doing Pathfinder the Adventure Card Game. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's best at two player only. Um, I just don't know if I feel. I guess I'd review it as a two-player only experience. Like I'd have to. We are talking about trying that one out, though. We're both intimidated to jump into that, which is a bad sign. Like we play some pretty heavy games and we're intimidated by it. Like that's what we'll see once we play. Like that's part of the review right there. The fact that I have a card game that both Deanna and I are intimidated to play because the rule book is just so dense and thick. Well, and not only the rule book, but you know, again, today, just today, I was editing our unboxing for the first expansion for yeah. the Pathfinder Core Game Bike. And the fact that you are talking about the sheer weight, the mass of the expansion that has mm -hmm. these five giant decks of cards. Oh. And that's just an expansion. And how much <laughs> info is on each card? Yeah. Like they're I, not just, it says plus two, right? It's yeah. not like a Star Realms card. It's, it's, it's dense in many different ways. <laughs> um, and so it's it's not really surprising that it's a little, uh, little, uh, Intimidating. Get to the table. All right. Supposedly Jeff has some comments that he left on the Discord because he could not get into that. I can't open up right now for risk of. Oh, true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You opening Discord will be bad. We don't usually keep that open. Anything else by anyone in the chat right now while this is loading up? Because this shouldn't kill anything on my end. You know, no, no one really. Uh... Jack, Come on, it's an AMA. We've people... talked about. Uh... You know, some of the stuff you've already talked about, we descended by the queen stuff. Um, Edgekill is mentioning uh, there's a rolling app, roll for your dot party, that allows uh, sure. dice allows everyone to see the dice rolled using a whiteboard in Zoom, and that app play some games. Uh, so Ryan has asked, are there games on your shelf you were totally hyped to get and totally intended to play? But haven't since you got to them, or are any of them still in shrink? Oh yeah, yeah, that that definitely happens still. Uh, Descent Second Edition, Descent Journeys in the Dark Second Edition, War of the Ring, War of the Ring, like that's like super was hard to get out of print. I got a copy of War of the Ring. That one is one. Uh, one sitting behind me right here, Eclipse. That's just because I need to unbox it, but and, and then it's going to sit because I'm not going to play it a long time. I have an expansion for Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition that I never actually got to the table that I paid way too much for. Uh, Battlestar Galactica expansions I seem bad for. Expansions are like box inserts. I get the expansion for the game, then I never play it uh, ever again because I don't know if we've moved on to other things. Um, there, yes, it happens. I, I get super excited. I'm like, oh, I got to have that game and I buy it. Now, I will admit, since starting the Bellhop, that happens a lot less often. Because I brought back a bunch of stuff from Origins I was excited to play. Once I had that pile, along with the pile of shame we are already talking about working through, now if I buy a game, I'm super excited about it. And they tend to get played within a week. Like, uh, Coimbra is one that we I finally got to the table. But it didn't sit that long. Like, I've only had it since Christmas, which really isn't... Yes, okay, it's four months, but it's not a super extensive period of time. But like, Clans of Caledonia, we've already reviewed. So I like if I look at my Excel file, that shows my pile of obligation, my reviews, and the stuff I bought. Everything I bought in 2019, I've already played. So I played every game I bought last year, which is pretty impressive for me. Not every game I had in the pile of obligation, but everything I bought, we played. We, we played multiple times on some of them, which never happened before, because now I'm just being a lot more selective in what I'm willing to buy. And when I buy it, I'm excited. I'm like, oh, I want to play this game. We're going to play this tonight, and I bring it home, and I, I do the unboxing video, and then I sit and prep it and everything else. So... But yeah, the, um, CO2. I backed the Kickstarter for CO2 Second Chance from Vital Lacerda. I love the original game. I finally did the unboxing video. That's live, but I don't know when I'm going to get that played. Um, they're there. Uh, th to be honest, that Pathfinder Adventure card game is one of them. I was really curious to try out that system. We have friends that play it. They Now they played the original printing. There's a new 2019 edition, which is what I have. But yeah, there are definitely games that I'm like, gotta have it, and then it sits there, and sometimes still in shrink. Uh, Conan. Um, Rune Wars. Rune Wars is a, I think it's called Rune Wars, it's a miniature game, and it was considered 
the the follow like the, the closest follow up to rank and file Warhammer Fantasy Battle, but still playing quickly. So it wasn't skirmish. It wasn't miniatures all over and small war bands. It was rank and file on bases, maneuvering and stuff like that, which is what I grew up playing, which Sean and I grew up playing. And I have a nostalgia feeling for that, but I don't want to play a game that takes all weekend, which is what the problem with the original was. And I heard Room Wars was really good. And there are some local gamers that swear it is the best miniature game ever made. But it's no longer supported. They killed it. And the local gamers are the type that once a game's dead, they stop playing, like, which gets frustrating, but I get it somewhat. They're like, oh, Fancy Flight doesn't support it. I can't play it anymore. And, I, and sometimes I'm like, what? The game police aren't going to show up and kill you for <laughs> not playing a game. But I get it. Like, you, you lose that. You know that you're never going to get anything new. You know you're never going to get new units. You're stuck with what you got. Maybe you go out and complete your collection or not. So I have literally a sealed, shrink-wrapped copy of Room Wars downstairs because I just never got around to it. I, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to play that, and I'm going to bring it out because the people play at Soul and Shop on Sundays, and there's a local community to play this game. This will be great. And I've even heard it's fantastic. But no, it's sitting there. It's it's in shrink wrap. It's downstairs. I considered se sh selling it, but like the price on Amazon right now, it's $100 MSRP. It's probably about 35 bucks on Amazon right now. So at this point, there's like no reason to even sell it because – it's just not, I don't know. We'll put it in an extra life auction or something at this point. All right. Well, Tex got a question for us. What is the next upgrade you would like to get for the tabletop bellhop setup? I think Sean's got that next to him actually. <laughs> so it's right there. It just has to come down to Windsor. It is. We have, we have light. We have a new light for, for uh, the bellhop. Yes. Uh, but technically we already have that. You just don't have it. So Yes, we, we have it. It's just <laughs> not down here. I think we need two. I don't think one's gonna be enough. That's one, part well, of the problem. One, one goes a long way. One is yeah. gonna, one is gonna make a big difference. Two would be ideal. Uh, yeah. I actually run two and then I've got a little a little face light in there for my for my catch light on my eyes. Um and, and I would actually, you know, honestly if, if I would keep this and use it as the third for a backlight too, because <laughs> three point lighting, but uh but I'm a geek. Um yeah. A lot of people deal with just one light, so it's not the end of the world. Um, so I don't know. I, I, like two lights was was the goal. So a light is probably the next big upgrade. Um, I I want to get two cameras going somehow. I just I don't even know how. I don't know if that involves like using an actual camera or getting another webcam. Part of it problem is Deanna's laptop. I really don't know if it's going to handle another camera, another input, or not. Um, I would like to get two cameras for our live plays and for unboxings. I want to be able to do the, the green screen thing where we have a face down and we can put cards under the camera or miniatures or whatever we're trying to show off. Like, oh, I got this card. Oh, I'm playing this. Yep. Like even our Gloomhaven game, right? So anyone who's watched our live streams, we've now taken to taking the two cards we're playing and putting them on the table in front of the camera, which I don't think anyone could read the text on them, but you might get an idea what the card is, especially if you play the class. You're probably going to be like, oh, I know those two cards. And we say the name of the card. But I would even more so love to throw them under a green screen and have them show up nice and big and readable for yep. the people who don't necessarily know the cards. Yep. And and like that and in other games, right? Even even when we were playing earlier today, I could show off the cards a lot better. I could be like, look, here's the six suits we are using to play today. And this is this card. This is this card. And then when we're actually playing, you'd be able to better tell from a distance what's actually out there on the board because you have seen it up close. Yeah. So that's something. So that involves some type of new camera, a new mount, and, well, a piece of construction paper, which I'm sure I could figure that one out. And then getting it to work on Dion's laptop, which also requires a USB port, which probably has to be powered. And D doesn't even have 3.0 USB. So, like, I don't know. Yeah. So another possible upgrade is a PC for downstairs. And we've been strongly considering that. Uh, basically putting it under the table, the, the legs of my game table are, what do you call that, concave? Yep. So you could basically nest. Like, it would be out of the way. It'd be very, it wouldn't be, no one's going to kick it. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least not that often, right? Like, <laughs> it, it should be mostly out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, for streaming-wise, realistically, uh, we can probably find something refurb uh, to go down there. Uh, yeah. and, and get something decent. It's not like we need a super gaming computer. No, you exactly. just need you just need something with the ports more than anything. Well, yeah, we, we need um, a we need a modern, yeah. more modern system that has USB 3.0 and and what one of the steps we actually took today. So here you go. This is what we did today. Is I, the cable 
for uh, not that anyone can see where I'm really pointing, now runs up my door and out my door and around the um, closet door and over my mom's door, over that, behind our spice rack and down the stairs. And that's how far we got. We got to figure out how we're going to wire it downstairs. What, what people aren't aware of is that every Friday night before Gloomhaven, there was a cable running party where we would, yes. where, where, where cable would get reeled out from the office down yeah. into the gaming area in order to make that Gloomhaven happen. You know, yes, semi because Wi-Fi was not working. No. So the another piece we want to add to that is I want to get a, a port down there, switcher, because the other problem I'm having is Disney Plus in Canada does not like my Wi-Fi. Netflix runs fine. Uh, Amazon Prime runs fine. But Disney Plus is unwatchable. So I don't well, know. Luckily, luckily that I can give you as well. When the light goes down, well, we'll bring yeah. a switch down and, and make sure you've got a switch. Yeah. And then uh, I just have I've got a dozen of their Mercos sitting around. Yeah. So I just need a switch and we got to mount that somehow. Yep. But yeah, That's I don't true. know. The, the lighting, I think, is going to make the biggest difference. And then, then it's going to be the tech for more cameras. I just don't know. Like, I don't know what order any of that stuff happens in. Yeah. I mean, well, like realistically for you guys, I, I know what I would love to get. The problem is funding. Um, yeah. Again, that's the big thing. Uh, the black magic mini mixer uh, has a mini, mini video mixer, uh, which can handle up to four different cameras uh, input, but then it outputs into your la into your, even your laptop as a USB camera. So with four inputs, though? Yeah, yeah, with four inputs. And then huh. you can mix picture in picture and, and do stuff like that. Wow. So it's, I mean, it's a video mixer, but it's designed yeah. for YouTubers. So it's it's a very small, compact little, yeah. little device. But it's, you know, it's a few hundred bucks, hundred bucks. So it's the, sort of the difference between that or a, or a computer at this point. Yeah, there's a, there, I have a local source for computers, and I think that's what I need to do is get a hold of my local source and just say, what can you do? Yeah. Right? Like, here's what I want to do. Really basic. What can you You got something in the back room, basically. But uh, I'm just popping a, a link in the chat room right now. That's the AT, ATEM Mini, which is the, the video mixer for YouTubers and uh, like us who don't need, you know, a studio mixer. But right need to be able to uh you know have more than one input and, and do some switching back and, and if forth. that's small that might be something useful for the future plans because I, I was talking to sean about this the other day i wouldn't mind portable setups for us to bring to cons specifically origins because origins gives you media room time where you can book one hour slots to actually do interviews and stuff yeah. and i think that would be cool to do like that's more of a, a dream kind of thing to do but to do that we would need portable equipment to yeah. be able to do it and i actually have a rolling audio rack and things that i can do but video is a different story, and that's yeah. that would be something for, for that sort of uh, setup. All right, jumping back a bit to the RPG, uh, now that i got Discord up and Jeff can take part. So you know that there is a World 20 module uh, that lets you play it online for For the Queen. I think I mentioned that. It's like under 10 bucks. Uh, there's also the Quiet Year, which is a simple map drawing RPG. Uh, math uh, Dave is involved, said the Quiet Year is interesting. Uh, people have used that to start their D&D campaign, which I think is more like a um, microscope type of thing where you're world building ahead of time. And then Follow by Ben Robbins is the simplest story game to teach and is very epic quest focused, like D&D, but plays more past the stick. So take out Follow by Ben Robbins. And thank you, Jeff, for the suggestion, because that's, that's not one I know. That definitely sounds like something, uh, if you're looking for something simpler than D&D, yeah. but you want that fantasy epic feel, that definitely sounds like a solid option. What was one that we had? This goes back a few, like quite a few episodes. Remember the Adventures of Varen von Munchausen? Yep. That one sounded fantastic, where you have like a which way book of story prompts, and you would tell a story, and then Sean would have to, like the next player would have to one-up you, and then the next player would have to one up them and you could spend some kind of resource to question them and go, no, no, you're, you're lying. You're, you're full of, yep. you're, you're full of BS, which that one sounded really cool. Yeah. No, oh, there absolutely. you go. That, so microscope kingdom and follow are all Ben Robbins. So microscope, right. I know kingdom, I know of uh, lady blackbird from back in 2009 yep. is another one. That's uh, yeah. I mentioned that one, the, the D six base one page RPG. All right, what else do we have? Do we have anything else? Rune Wars is weird, unnecessary confusion. Prior to the minis games, there was a Rune Wars, the board game. Yes, I have the board game. The board game is actually really interesting. Uh, 
Rune Wars is actually a really good 4X epic fantasy game where you're almost playing two games at once where you're controlling your kingdom and movie stuff around, but you're also playing heroes that are running around doing things. I actually really like the Rune Wars board game. As for the miniature game, I don't know. People I know love it. So I don't know. I, I'm hoping, I think Ryan's saying it's unnecessary confusion due to the fact that there are multiple games with the same name. Uh, well, that's about all we've got in the chat. Anyone else have any other questions here? Finish uh, finish this sentence. Brandon Picker writes, <laughs> yeah, I want to play games, but I'm not desperate enough to play. <laughs> Candyland. I got to use that. That's the one there we always go. use on this that's show. The one. There's got to be better ones. Though. No, uh, no, I would Monopoly play Candyland. Could, uh... Um, Monopoly, I Candy actually World. would play Monopoly just because I, to be honest, I never tried Monopoly with the real rules. I never have. I grew up with the uh, too many houses in the box because it's someone cobbled together version with too many houses and the bank had infinite money. And sometimes we did the, the free parking. Sometimes we didn't, we never did the auction. So I, I like Monopoly sounds like it should be an answer there, but no, that's not there. Um, I would not play cards against humanity. I have no interest in that whatsoever or many of the other variants of adult gross. We're going to make you say inappropriate things, games. Um, there are, there are groups. I will play those with um, some. I won't, you know? Yeah. That, but I don't know. I'll play other games that are adult games. Math, math that, guy that Dave says I... clue. I will play clue. I will not play Harry Potter clue. Yeah. There you go. Me. Yep. Uh, no, I, I play Clue. Clue's all right. I, yeah. Me and Deanna have played Clue. Clue's a decent enough game. I, it's okay. Um, I, I, there's not a lot that I wouldn't ever play. I'm sure they're out there. Like, like I said, the most of them are the, the, the adult silly games, uh, the X-rated games, the 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 Swingers Monopoly that came up. Oh, that wasn't on this show. That was on. So <laughs> it that was that was on when I was talking to Chris uh, Chris Marentet the other day. While we were chatting, someone in the chat room said they picked up a Monopoly game, and oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. And it, it was drink your, Drinking Monopoly, Drinking Monopoly, which they thought was going to be like, do a shop and you land on these spots. Well, it was also Swingers Monopoly. And that did not go over well at the game night they broke it out at, because they broke it out without having read the rules before playing. So right. I wouldn't play that. I have no interest in playing any of those okay. adult games. I know some people are into that, but not, not for me. Uh, Mario Monopoly. Yeah, yeah we tell. I think we we talked about Mario. I, I would That's try. A good one. I, I would try Monopoly Gamer. I hear Monopoly Gamer is really good. I end up that ended up going on my top five Monopoly games. Yep. Uh, and there, there's an, another one too. There's the, the what is it? Mario there's, Kart. Yeah. There's Sonic. There's Overwatch. All of those are versions of Monopoly Gamer. I try Overwatch would be nothing to me though. Like I know none of nothing about Overwatch. Uh, so Drinkopoly might have been the game. Drinkopoly, yeah, that Drinkopoly, sounds right. the blurriest game ever. Yeah, that uh, sounds right. Sounds, uh, it it doesn't come out. It doesn't say it's a swingers game, but it definitely talks about like kissing challenges and yeah stuff well, like that. Yeah, but no thanks. More of a more of a college dorm party than mm. than a family game. <laughs> so I don't think they broke it out at a family game night, but I think it was one that, like had the neighbors over yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, it was pretty amusing. I say I totally forgot it wasn't on this show because of that. <laughs> Uh, well, heck, at uh, Extra Life last year, we gave away, or didn't give away, we auctioned off several adult games. They were some of our most popular yep. games. Yeah, to be year. honest, people people they, do we're, like them. Do. You know what? And they're, you know what? They're great. They can be great as a couple's game. Yes. As groups, they can get awkward. But yeah. if you want to play adult games as an adult couple, go right ahead. Heck, More if you want to do it as you. groups, go ahead. As long as everyone's signed up. As long as, everyone's it, as, long as up. everyone buys into it. Yep. And you're not surprising Jim and Bob, or yes, Stephen, or even worse, one the street. of a couple. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you got both both parties buy in if you're going to play any of those games. I remember years ago, Deanna and I got something. I don't even remember what it was called, and we tried to play once, and we're like, "This is just dumb. Like, this is just <laughs> terrible. This is a barely game. a game." Come on, and all right, let's homebrew it. <laughs> yeah, we we could have. It was it was bad. I think we probably still have it upstairs. Uh... And something positions or something it was called. And I was yeah. just like, this isn't even like, it, it wasn't even like kinky and fun. It was just right. dumb. Like it yep. was we're like, all right, let's just put this away. Not, not, not my kind of games, but like I said, all the power to you. I, whatever works. 
Uh, all right. We sell what is it? Triple Xopoly. We have sold a few copies of, which I have to assume is from our date night post because there's a link there. So <laughs> sounds better. It, it's it's the if you sign up for the drinking game monopoly and it becomes the swinger game monopoly. There you go. That's not the right thing. Right. So we got a question from Christopher John who asks, "What's everyone's favorite dexterity game?" You know, it's hard to pick a favorite, right? So. I like dexterity games in general, but my God, there's some great ones. Like, oh man, I apologize. I ate Mexican tonight. I should not eat Mexican before a podcast. I think we've covered that before on this show. Uh Yes, I'm not the one to plan dinner. Um, so so there's like a a top list. Like, like Go Cuckoo is so amazing. Like, I, I don't see how that can't be my favorite. Like, Go Cuckoo is just so accessible. Both my kids could play it. You could possibly even play that with a toddler. Like, like it, it is so dead simple, easy yep. to teach, and amazing how good and bad different people are at it. Like, yep. like I played with a nurse that was just like, <laughs> and that's how quick they would pull sticks and nothing would fall. And yep. I'm just like, oh, and then I got other people that would balance stuff on the very edges and sticking out and make this giant net. Oh, that game's amazing. Yep. Like, but then how do I compare that to Pitch Car? Like, Pitch Car is just so much fun every time I play it. Everyone who plays it enjoys it. And like, and it's just so what I love about pitch car is I could get Joe off the street to play it. One of my most favorite nights of playing pitch car was at a bar downtown called villains bistro where we were having a gaming night and the gaming night's supposed to add it at 10 and then a live band's supposed to start. Well, the night I brought out pitch car, cause it was racing night. All the games were race or sports. It was sports night. All the games everyone brought were sports teams. It didn't end. We were there till three in the morning playing pitch car and it was by the end of the night, it was like me and um, oh, a local gamer who I haven't, Yannick, Yannick Allard, who I haven't seen in a long time. Hey, Yannick, if you happen to listen to our podcast and him and strangers that like just came in and saw what we were doing and started taking part. Like it's like playing darts, right? Like people just see you flicking this thing around. Oh, can I play? Can I do it? And of course, there was lots of alcohol going on, which doesn't matter. It's pitch car. Like, yeah, OK, you knock it off the track a bit more. Love pitch car. And then you can add all the extra tracks and the jumps and the the loop-de-loops and the figure eights and all the different things you can do with it. So uh, how do I rank that versus Go Cuckoo? And then there's Hamster Roll, which is the like the thinking man's dexterity game yep. because it's all about positioning that piece and which piece to play. And yes, there is dexterity involved. You do have to have some skill to put those things on the wheel, but it's it's all about screwing your neighbor basically and making sure they can't play and looking at what pieces they have left. like all three of those i love all three of those but i also and, like junk art mm. well and then there's also um sort of games that aren't dexterity games but are dexterity games like climbers yeah which the which I, it's game. not a dexterity game but it really kind of is at the same time yep um which is you know which is a great one but yeah no i mean that go cuckoo and and hamster roll especially are so incredible incredibly different yes. and fantastic in their own ways for different groups of people. Oh, that's it. And, or even the same groups of people. Yeah. Like, the same people like both. And there's other like, like junk art. You take every different stacking game you can possibly imagine for stacking weird shapes and throw it all in one box and randomize what little micro game you play. Like, see, to me, I, that I, re- and see, I wasn't a huge fan of, of uh, junk. Oh, you didn't like, see, I like junk. I like how one time it's about stacking. The next time it's about getting them next to each other. Then the next one's all about how tall you can make it. Then the next time it's all about speed. I love that game. But there are so many. But yeah, I, I think the big three are Hamster Roll, Go Cuckoo, and Pitch Car. And I don't know which wins out of both those. Depends who I'm with and what I'm playing. And if I've got eight people, it's going to be Pitch Car because you can't play the other games with eight people. And see, I barely even consider pitch car a, a dexterity yes it is it's absolutely a, oh, definitely. a dexterity yeah. game. but it's weird because i don't when i think of dexterity games it never comes to mind um it's it you know i, I think of the the penguin game before i think of the oh yeah, that's that. another one ice yeah. cool that's a it's great cool. clicky game um all right so we got a question another question from the chat room from mountain papa all right. games given to you as a gift did you say thanks but you were thinking no thank you Oh, this is know what the funniest one is, and I've now heard it's a good game, but we never played it. Is we used to sell the N and I used to sell on eBay professionally. There was a small business we owned called Retro Toy Box, and we sold vintage toys. And someone gave us the eBay board game one year because they're like, we know you sell on eBay, and I, I don't remember if it was it was D's sister or mom. I don't remember where it came from, and it was this like electronic game with you had to figure out the prices on things. And we never played it. It went up like we were at the apartment in the time 
and we put it up. At, like, I remember where it sat in the top of the closet. This is before I owned as many games. Like, I remember it sitting there forever and, like, moving and being like, oh, yeah, the eBay game. And eventually we just got rid of it. And what's funny is, I don't know, it's when I started listening to podcasts, someone, Tom Vassell, or like a big podcaster, was going on about how good it is. They were like, oh, man, I guess we should have gave it a try. <laughs> but we just assumed, like, a licensed yeah. game based on eBay, there is no way. That is the one I remember the most. That, like, I remember getting eBay the board game and, and just being like, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that. I was kind of that way. Uh, and it wasn't even my gift. It was my kid's gift. But someone got them the, the Doctor Who Yahtzee. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool-looking TARDIS. And they opened it up, and we saw that it was just – plastic interior with no padding or any like Ooh. belt or anything and i'm like okay i don't want this game anymore <laughs> it's just yahtzee and then it turned out that the yahtzee dice were graphically bad enough that you had a hard time figuring out oh, what everything was and it's like okay well i got these three things and that but is that a full house or is that a straight is that a small straight i'm not even sure if that's a small straight is that a I got mm -hmm. these four different dice, but maybe that's not a small straight. I, like, I don't know. So, yeah, I like, give me just some die six for my Yahtzee. Yeah, I, I love Doctor Who. Local, 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 a friend of ours, Two's, got the Dragon Ball Yahtzee. Right. And it was the same thing. I'm like, so how do you know if that's a straight or not? It was like all characters' faces. Yeah. Like, well, if you get one of each different character's face, it's a straight. I'm like, yeah. I guess. Okay, sure. I I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to think for gifts. I don't when I get games for gifts, they tend to be off wish list right. because everyone knows I have a large <laughs> collection. So it's yeah. not often I get random games. So um I think at one point I got the Snarf Quest game as a gift from someone, and that was absolutely horrible. That was one of the worst games I ever played. It was my most negative review on the my old blood, the Windsor Gaming Resource, before I wrote the Master of the Universe review, which is the one that tops all of them. And it was so bad. Like, it was just terrible. It came with a miniature, the Snarf miniature from right. Snarf Quest. And, but like, you literally randomly moved on a track and then you read a passage that was a passage from the comic book and you rolled the die to see if you could take the card or not. And if you didn't, it was the other player's turn or something. Like, it was like as, as bare minimum a game as possible from a comic that's licensed off DD. Like, come on make yeah. an actual game out of it <laughs> yeah i know uh midge kale in the chat room saying uh doctor agrees with doctor who yahtzee and apparently there was a doctor who clue Oof. uh star wars risk <laughs> um you know ways to take good games and make them bad which we talked star about wars risk the the star wars risk i have is fantastic yeah. star wars risk the black series risk i really like actually if it's the same one where you're fighting three battles at once you've got the battle uh in space you've got luke fighting vader and then you've got Han on Endor. And you have to use your cards. And each card is going to affect two of those things, but not the third. Okay. So you have to decide which two battles you want to progress on tracks on or move your dice. And then there's some dice rolling stuff. And I actually really like that game. It's a it's a re-theme of the Queen's Gambit, which is one of the big rail games that everyone everyone is trying to get a hold of. Okay. Which was when episode one came out. And you fought the Battle of Thede. So you had the the clone army versus the Gungans, and then you had Qui Gon Jinn and Obi Wan fighting Darth Maul, and then you had the palace where the Queen literally had to move up this three D thing to get try to get to capture Newt Gunray, and it's considered one of the best board games of all time. And this is a retheme of it, which people are saying is not as good. Now I never got to play the original, so I can't compare it. But that Star Wars Risk is really good for what it is. Like it's no Twilight Imperium, it's no Eclipse, it's no <laughs> Star Wars Rebellion. But like compared to Risk or Monopoly or, or Stratego, I thought it was really good. I really like that game actually. Like like that's one I can play with my girls, and right. they can get it right. Like it's Star Wars. It's like Star Wars accessible enough to an eight year old, which is part of what I like it. And it's strategic enough that like I said deciding. It's like oh, do I want to fight in the space battle or do I want to try to beat Darth Vader? Oh, I still got to get the moon on Endor down, or I can't blow up the Death Star, and I'm trying to do it all at once. Right. But yeah, it shouldn't be called Risk. Ryan's right. <laughs> Ryan in the chat is saying, calling it Risk is totally mis misbranding. Yeah. It's got miniatures on a map and you roll D6s. I, yeah. I think that's I mean, enough. It, again, and, and a lot of that, again, is the marketing. We've talked about this in previous episodes. If you can tie two major big properties together, that yeah. just increases the, you know, the, the purchasability. You know, mm -hmm. hey, I have a friend who likes playing Risk in Star Wars, so Star Wars Risk must be amazing. Yes. 
Yeah. And it is good, in my opinion. Yeah, Deanna said, so Catan's risk. No, because you don't, you don't move guys on squares and then attack yeah. guys on other squares to take those squares. Right. I think that there's a better description on it. Right. Yeah, and then, no. So, uh, Ryan in the chat room asked, have you backed something on Kickstarter only to have your enthusiasm die for it before even receiving it? Ah. Uh, I'm thinking yes, but I'm I'm drawing a blank on what. So my my guess for this would be one that I actually lost so much enthusiasm from. I pulled my money before it had even finished uh the thing, which was that uh strange Greek Odyssey massive oh, that thing. Yes. game where we first looked at it uh during our pod during our, our show on uh on Kickstarter and yeah. I went and I dropped a lot of money on it. Uh and then a couple of weeks later, we watched an actual play and it was so obscure and overly complex. And, and, and it was just, it looked like it would make Gloomhaven look like a fun family game. And I pulled I, my money out that night. Yeah. I do not remember what the name of that game was. It was a Greek thing, right? It was yeah. like the, the time of the gods. With yeah. The yeah, yeah. There, there were all sorts of the Odysseus type of thing. Titans and yeah. 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 I remember, I remember. And that actual play um, didn't do them any favors. <laughs> yep, did not. Yeah, yeah, you could mod the minis. I remember that yep. was part of it. You could, you could like your minis would upgrade and change and yep. stuff. It there was some neat stuff going on in that. But yes, oh yeah, I mean the concept on the Kickstarter page they sold it yep. well because they got a, a more than a hundred dollars of my money mm -hmm. uh, to back it until I saw it play. I am trying to think of Kickstarters that back that I. Yeah, there aren't too many. I don't think you got, but before Maybe you've I, gotten, that you yeah, lost. That I'm trying to think that I didn't care by the time they. Oh, well, video game ones. When I first started back in Kickstarter, I, we were talking about this the other day. So yes, there are two video games I backed. I still haven't even booted. I literally have never double clicked on the icon to even play them. Uh, the first was the first. Well, it's the second Kickstarter I backed. The first Kickstarter I backed. Here's a different question. Was by, uh, I don't remember the actor's the the, the artist's name, but it was for maps. And it was back in the day, Kickstarter was brand new. And this is someone who did uh, one inch gridded maps and they did sci-fi ones. And he had done one map that was this like space station. And he had done another map that was a docking bay where the space station would land in it. And he was kickstarting a third map that was another part of the space station that had like a market in it. And this was his third Kickstarter. The other two were delivered. So I felt confident at this point. I'm like, look, person's delivered two Kickstarters before. I kind of want to back this. But what he actually did was he then put out what he called space station tiles. And he took the map basically and cut it into like four by eight squares so you can rearrange it. And that's what I wanted. So I actually wrote him and said, look, that's an add-on item. Like you have to back the Kickstarter to get this. What if you only want that? Or is there something you can do? And I thought it was really cool because he went and edited his Kickstarter to make that a different backer level. And back then, like stretch goals, no one had even thought of that yet right this is going quite a bit back like i don't like 2014 2015 like kickstarter was still it wasn't the big thing it was now and i backed that and i actually got it three months early they showed up the station tiles showed up they were exactly what i wanted you could use wet and dry erase on them i can make various things at the time i was running gamma world it was perfect i was also running star wars d20 worked great um the next thing I backed, and now I totally forget what the question was I was answering. Why Why was I going to talk about this? I uh, got distracted. You, the, you lost enthusiasm before receiving. Oh, right. Video game. That's right. So the next thing I backed was Wasteland 2. So I don't remember the original Wasteland, but I guess that was like a huge um, post-apocalyptic game that, that spawned Fallout. The, the, the Fallout series uses the same engine. Like Fallout 1 is technically Wasteland 2, basically. And this guy was like, he's the original designer. I can't remember his name. He's a famous computer RPG designer, not Lord British, but someone else who's really well known. The guy who invented follow whoever he is. And he was going to put out an official wasteland too. So this is, if I didn't do follow, here's where I would have went with the original wasteland story. And I got so involved with that, that I remember going to their party the day they funded and they were all live streaming their office and drinking beers and like sitting there having a beer and cracking it open. Cause that felt like, Oh, I helped make this thing. I don't even know when the game showed up, but it was like two and a half years later. And I was just like, what? Oh yeah. I, I remember back in that. Yeah. Kickstarter was like this new thing. And I felt like I was part of the group that made that happen. I don't tend to get that feeling from Kickstarter anymore. 
And then I made the silly mistake of them backing Shadowrun Anarchy, which is a by a similar group that put out the Shadowrun game that's, again, more like a Baldur's Gate style, and I never played it. It's on my desktop. I, that one I backed at, like, a high level so that I actually have, like, the there's expansions and all this stuff for it, and I have all of that and never double-clicked or even started it. Now, what I did do is by backing Wasteland 2 at the time, right when it funded, they gave everyone Wasteland 1. So at that point, I was excited, and I did play Wasteland 1. And I totally forgot it was a game that was designed in the 80s or 90s and that you should hit save before opening every door. And I played for four and a half hours, opened a door to a bar, and then saved. Then continued to get shot by a shotgun that killed my character. That was a trap that you couldn't do anything about. So when I reloaded my save, I just died again. And if I reloaded my save, I just died again. There was no way to get back. And I would have had to replay right from the beginning. Because I totally, I remember, I'm like, oh, wait, I should save. No, sorry, it auto-saved. It auto-saved when I went through the door. Sorry. I didn't choose to save because I totally forgot that in 80s games, you need to tell it to save. And I should have saved before opening the door. And sure, there was probably some hint somewhere that someone was hiding behind the door with shotgun. So it auto-saved when I opened the door and my character died. And then I reload the autosave, and then my character opens the door, and I die, and I die, and I try a bunch of different things. No way to get out of it. And I would have had to start the game over, and I never did. Yeah, that's rough. Definitely. But yeah, that's just, you don't get that anymore, right? Like like games now, when their autosaves are smart enough, they put you back to a safe spot, or they save every hour, or whatever. You just don't see that. And I just, like, I should have known. I grew up playing these games with my dad, where, like, you're about to open a chest, save. You're about to, you're about to go into a building for the first time, save. You're about to spawn a new map safe you know about yep. to get on your boat safe absolutely uh midge kill in the chat room saying miskatonic university the restricted collection still sitting unplayed on the shelf yeah i remember that one i could see rpgs uh oh there there's an rpg one tremulous tremulous was um apocalypse world was was the big thing it just hit and everyone was going nuts over powered by the apocalypse well powered by the apocalypse i don't even think it was a term at the point i read apocalypse world and at the time, I don't where was I? It must have been G+. Some forum where I was reading about role-playing games, and this seemed like the new thing, and it seemed very different and foreign to me. And I was not a fan of the sex moves in Apocalypse World. Like, that just instantly turned me off. I'm like, this game has sex moves. I don't want to play a game with sex moves. That's not something I want to come up at the table of people I play with. So I instantly discredited Apocalypse World. I'm like, no, no interest in this particular game. But man, everyone's going nuts for this engine. And then... I don't know the name of who produced it because it's been too long, announced I'm going to do Call of Cthulhu as a Powered by the Apocalypse. Well, see, I like the idea and the concept of Cthulhu. I'm not a huge Mythos fan, but I hate the basic role-playing D100 system. So my personal experience with Call of Cthulhu was two extremely bad role-playing sessions that are unforgettable, like just terrible experiences. Part of that being based on the mechanics, more of it being based on the Game Master, but it doesn't matter. Tainted. I didn't want to play Call of Cthulhu, but I was very interested in playing that world and here's this new system that's all narrative driven where it's all about moves and it's not about your character sheet and it sounded awesome it sounded so awesome that i got eight other people in windsor to back it with me and ordered 10 books and so i would have the store got three and then me and a bunch of other people in windsor got copies of this book and we got like a discounted price i've never read the book i literally have not it's downstairs by the time it showed up. Like we were all excited. We were all going to get together and I like, it's a power by the apostle. We didn't even need, need our own copy, but we were all supposed to play so, all six of us. And we were going to run a, a campaign at the local store. No, it's, it's downstairs. Right. Um, mobile frame zero. I actually went out and bought all the dice to be able to play it. Once I read the PDF and that's a game where you make mechs out of robots. Um, it's a updated version of Mechaton, which is the original version, and it uses Lego, or sorry, constructible bricks, whatever, to make Mecha, and there's neat stuff like destroyable scenery and all this stuff. Yeah, I, I went to Origins the year that came out and bought specific dice, and I went and bought Lego for it. Like, we went to uh, the Von Mills Mall, which is the mall closest to Canada's Wonderland, which is the closest place to eat when you don't want to eat in Canada's Wonderland, and when you don't know the area. I'm sure there's other things, but if you don't know the area, there's a Cracker Barrel there. That's actually Cracker Barrel is actually surprisingly good. Well, there's also a Lego store, which I'd never been in one in my life. And they have the brick containers at the end where you just like can buy individual bricks and you can buy, you get like a container that's this big and it's whatever, 12 bucks. And you could fill the container with what you wanted. And there were all these bits that Mobile Frame Zero uses, right? Like these little clips and these eyes and things that, oh, I, buy, I bought a ton of Lego 
And like I said, at Origins, I literally went, I want seven yellow dice. I want six red D8s. I need three blue D6s because that's how you represented your stats. Never played. I, I did read that one. And Deanna's point, we went back with lists to get the ones we missed. I never <laughs> built them back. Yep. That's, that, that was one that by the time I, I got the physical book, because this was all based on the PDF, I was doing like the pre-work to yeah. when this comes in, I'm going to be ready to play. Yeah, when it came in, I didn't care. That's when I regret. I should do something with that. Like uh, the Legos all still downstairs. All right. If there's one more question, I think we have time for one more before we move on. All right. Uh, let's do something. Uh, what is from Andrew Black? What is the best Cthulhu themed game? All right. Uh, well, I just went on about how much I don't care too much about Cthulhu. Um, Role-playing game based on reading it only and not playing, I would say Trail of Cthulhu. It sounds the most interesting. It removed the dead end. The, you didn't find the clue, so you can't continue. Was removed from the game. Robin Laws came up with a system called the Gumsu system where you get the clue, like, automatically. Your characters are so competent that as long as you are trained in the required skill, you get the key clue in the scene. It's automatic. Um... But then you do dice for stuff. It's it's got a really unique system. It's got it's resource based where you spend your stats to do things. Has a really good chase system. The problem is all of that information is based on hearsay. I own the book. I've read the book. I we even made characters for it. It sounds great. I've listened to a couple actual plays, but I have not actually seen it played. So, as far as I can tell, to me that blows away the. I, I said I do not like the basic role playing system that the the big Call of Cthulhu role-playing game is based on. I've never been a fan of that system. So that's my favorite RPG. And board games, I've got to say Cthulhu Death May Die. Out of all the ones i played, and I've played quite a few different Cthulhu games, there's a lot out there. I really like the fast, furious, throwing dice, things are on fire, everyone's going insane, what the heck's going on? One of the characters is killing other characters in the other room because they shouldn't be together, and sean shooting fireballs down the stairs and i like it just kind of nuts and over the top and i found that a lot of fun compared to your usual move around the board get the right clues collect the right symbols roll the right dice close the gates whatever I, all all the elder sign uh what is it arkham horror eldritch horror all of those i did not enjoy um but cthulhu death may die was so great just so over the top uh the, it's just a very different feel and i really enjoyed the feel of that the miniatures are great and everything else too but like the actual gameplay of that i found the most fun out of any of the cthulhu games i played now he's mentioning chill which is not a cthulhu game it no. is a mystery horror game but have they put out cthulhu expansions for chill not that I am aware of. They didn't for the version of Chill I played. Now Chill is still going. They, Chill they was a fantastic our... game. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that genre. I could do it without ever playing another RPG of that type. But if I was going to, Chill yeah, is the one I probably the one. need to. <laughs> yeah, Chill. Chill. The modern Chill. They they put it back out. So they have put up a new, uh, new version of Chill. They kickstarted it. It's got a new logo. Um. I don't know what they've done. Like from what I understand, they I think they were purposely trying to distance themselves going, we are not Cthulhu because right. they stuck very much to werewolves, vampires, ghosts, psychics. Like it was all like, not, not even, they didn't even go universal monsters, right? They went more urban horror. Like this is stuff that could exist. And that was the whole premise of chill was that you are part of a secret society that knows that the monster under the bed is real. Like that, that was the whole premise. And you're the men in black, right? Except versus uh, uh, whatever, ethereal horrors versus aliens. You you were the last defense of humanity and you are the chosen few that have the ability. I even, I, what was it called? It was something like see the unseen or something. Yeah. And every troubleshooter, I think you were called, had the ability to see the unseen. And then some actually had some magic. Others just had weapons. And it, it the game was so great because it, played very much uh down and dirty like there there wasn't the mythic tomes or the portals opening it was much to me much more horrible more well, more horrific well, the, the other the other big focus one of the big difference i think from call of cthulhu and chill is chill you are essentially heroes 
trying yeah. to deal with. You're not. You're never going to kill all the bad guys, but you're going to kill oh this werewolf that's yes. causing a problem in the city. Whereas in Call of Cthulhu, you're going to go insane, or uh, you know, you're going Eventually. to have your mind broken or die. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how long it takes until you get there. Yeah, realistically. And plus, in this, your heroes as a poet, Call of Cthulhu, you're usually hapless people who get toward tossed into something. Right, your your investigators and journalists and historians and librarians that suddenly find out about some unspeakable horror and feel the need to do something about it. Whereas Chill was very much, no, no, these things are real and we need to stop them. Yeah. And and you're being heroic about it. Whereas Cthulhu, your best chance is to run away. Whereas although it did have that, you couldn't just go face on, which is part of why the system was good. It was all about doing the research. It was all about finding the way to kill the thing, finding the weakness was pretty much every chill game we ever played was find the thing well find the thing find out what the thing is then find out how to kill the thing then kill the thing was right. pretty much the plots yeah Dracula delta, delta green, green is one that a lot of people are talking about i was actually hoping to get into a delta green game at uh uh uh, uh the con this year yes that origins one. or qcc or, or uh, uh, breakout. breakout that's the one yeah, yeah the breakout. one i was actually going to Yes. <laughs> Dracula Dossier looked good. That was a whole... That's Delta Green. That's part of Delta Green. Delta Green does use gunshoot. Delta Green is... Um, Jason Bourne meets... Uh, the Call of Cthulhu. Or, or vampires. Or kind of does all of those. Right. We played a game of Delta Green. But all it was was one quick combat scene. And it wasn't so great. Right. That was more a failing of the quick start rules that someone found online for us to try. <laughs> DM did as good as they could with what they had at hand, I think. It was not a, a great list. So I've never heard of that. The Laundry RPG is based on the Laundry Files series by Charles Strauss. I, I have heard of... Well, I know Charles Strauss. I've heard of the Laundry Files, but I've never read them. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I said Cthulhu RPGs. Is, I said Gumshoe, I wanted to see the system. And I've read it. It sounds fantastic. The rules are presented two ways, which is cool. So you can do Pulp Cthulhu, or you can do uh, Lovecraft Cthulhu. I don't remember what they call the investigative. And you can literally do both. And it basically just depends on how many more investigative skills versus you get versus, like, gun and athletic skills and different ways to play adventures. This one's going to be rough to go through the notes later. Yeah. <laughs> we are all over the place tonight. But yeah, at this point, I think we'll go on. We do have a review to get to. We do have uh, and quite a bit of games played this last week. So thank you, everyone, for your questions. It's greatly appreciated. I'm glad we were able to get some off screen. Like, we did have some people send in stuff ahead of time, so it was nice to be able to, to backlog it. But you guys do rock in, you folk rock in the chat room for coming up with anything you can. So that's it for our April AMA. Th big thanks to everyone who asked a question tonight. We do one of these live Q&As every month on the last Wednesday of the month. So join us next month on the 27th for our end of May AMA. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page. I I'm just shocked we didn't get a bunch more questions. That's usually what happens when we end an AMA. Up next, look at the two-player cooperative card game, The Fox in the Forest Duet. All right, The Fox in the Forest Duet was designed by Foxtrot Games and features art by Adrian Azell, Jason D. Kingsley, Rowena Peraz, and John Shoulders. It was published by Renegade Game Studios in North America in 2020. As far as I know, they're the only publisher so far. It only plays two players, and each game takes... About half an hour, I'd say a little less. Again, this is usually the spot where I send you to YouTube for our unboxing video, but yet again, we don't have one. Yeah, last week I mentioned I had the Fox in the Forest on loan from Terry from Renegade Games. And while she lent me the Fox in the Forest, when she gave me that, she also gave me Duet because she wanted to have me compare the two. She wanted to see what I thought of both of them. So I picked both these up. These were all punched and ready to play when I got them. So no unboxing video, sorry. Not as much fun for those who love the act of getting a game ready, but certainly faster to get it to the table. Very true. Very true. Now, over on the blog, I break down exactly what you get. Um, I'm not going to go through every component here, but I will say you do get uh, the main thing is a deck of cards. Uh, it's 30 cards this time, numbered one through 10 in three different suits. These suits are doves, roses and stars. Uh, each odd numbered card has a special ability in it, very similar to the other game and features fantastic looking fairy tale style artwork. Uh, there's also two reference cards. 
You get a two-sided player board, because this does involve a board, and then a whole bunch of tokens with some gems, some forest tiles, and a wooden player token that goes in the middle. Opponents are all great. Um, I was especially impressed by the board because it would have been really easy for Renegade just to put in like a thin card, like a Terraforming Mars style thing to flip over. This is a, it's small, but it's a full board. Like it's a normal mounted board. So I was impressed by that. So how do you play this version of Fox in the Forest? All right. To start off duet, you place the player board between the two players. On it, you're going to place a number of gems. So this board has like a track on it, and you start in the middle of it, and you place gems at various nodes on the track. And you're going to use, uh, there's two sides of the board, one's more difficult, and the number of gems you place are going to be based on the difficulty levels. There's three difficulty levels to start. You put the orange disc, the tracking token, right in the middle to start it off. You start each round by dealing out 11 of the 30 cards to each player. That leaves eight cards in the deck. You flip over the top card, which is your decree card, which sets the trump. The non-dealer leads, and you play through 11 tricks. Tricks here are trick-taking rules. Follow the suit, trump, win, takes the trick. Everything you know from every trick game you ever played applies here. It's the same as Fox 4, it's the same as Euchre. Whoever wins the trick determines where that player token moves on the forest track, which is kind of neat. The distance move is based on the number of animal tracks on the cards, and each card has a different number of tracks on it from one to three. If you stop where there's a jam, you collect it. Now, the bad part is if you end up going off the end of the track, that's a mistake, and you've gotten lost, and you add that a forest token to the board, which makes the track shorter and make things more difficult. Plus, if you run out of wood tokens, the forest tokens, you lose the game. So, realistically, it's a trick-taking game that you know has a, a fancy mechanic for counting the tricks you've taken. In a, yeah, in a way, but it's also how far, right, with right. the, the footprint. So if Deanna takes a trick, the token's going to move towards her, but it's the combination of both our cards that determines how far. Whereas if I take the trick, it's going to move towards me, but again, it's the combination of our cards that's going to determine how far. So it's the, if D's going to play a three and I'm going to play a three, we're going to move six. Whereas if we're on her end of the board, that's probably safe. But if we're in the middle, we're going right off the board. Right. So it's all about trying to judge not only just winning the trick, but how far you want to move. And while we'll get to why that's difficult in a little bit. Now, can, so just maybe I'm jumping ahead here. I, I don't know, but can you intentionally, hey, I'm going to lose this. Can I mess you over by pushing you off the track? Well, there's no messing over because it's a cooperative game. Right. So uh, you right. don't want to mess over anyone. Right. This is co-op. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is a co-op game. If you're Sorry. messing anyone I'm over, you're messing I'm far too competitive tonight, over. apparently. Yes, you're thinking too competitively. No, no, this is a cooperative game. You don't want to go off the track or push. There's only one character token that represents both of you, I guess. Right. So similar to the other game, every odd number card has a special ability. Uh, so for example, the one is the musician. That, no matter who wins the trick, you can decide which way to go. So if you do that mess up and you're like, ooh, we're moving too far, well, we can go the other way. Or another one is the fox, which lets you switch the trump for another card. Um, what's another one? The five. The five is the gazelle. And what the five does is let you ignore the tracks on one of the cards. Now, the gazelle has a one on it. So say I'm right at the edge of the track and I want to move two and you play a three and I play my one. and I'm like, oh, that's not going to work. Well, you can ignore your three and just move one. Okay. Now, at the end of each round, after you've done all the tricks, you should have hopefully collected a whole bunch of gems. You're going to add a forest token to one end of the path. You get to pick which end and then you put out some new gems. And there's just certain spots on the board that respawn gems. Don't ask me how that makes sense thematically. Whatever. There's more gems. Times come by. They grow. I don't know. Whatever. If you haven't won, by the end of the third round, you lose due to running out of time. And then I also noted earlier, if you get all the wood tokens, the forest tokens played, you lose that way. You're considered lost. You win by collecting all of the gems that are out on the board, including the ones that have spawned between rounds. Now, to make this more difficult, and here's where it gets interesting, is you have to follow very strict communication rules. You can't talk about your cards, you can't ask revealing questions, and you cannot discuss strategy. So basically, you do not get to talk about the game at all. So there's no bluffing elements, there's no, it's, it's almost like medium, like you're looking at your opponent's eyes, looking at the board, hoping they have done the mental math in their hand to go, well, they know I don't have a three, and you know you have a three, so I'm hoping he plays a three so that we can move two or whatever it is. That's pretty much it. Um, I got to say, I was impressed. Um, 
what was more impressive to me is Deanna liked it, and Deanna does not normally like cooperative games. So if Deanna sold on a cooperative game, I, I think you got a winner there. Uh, it takes the basic mechanics from Fox in the Forest and does something completely new with them. Like, you're still taking tricks, like, and it's still only three suits, and you've got the odd-numbered cards, do special things, and even some of the special things are identical between the two games. Uh, but the new combination of card powers and the whole moving on the track with the central board is just brilliant. Like, it just works really well. Like, again, I, I was blown away by Fox in the Forest. Oh, wow, I have a trick-taking game that works two players. Now you turn that into co-op, and I'm just kind of like, wow. Like, the design team behind this is brilliant. It's just, it, it's still, I'm I'm still struggling. I, I've listened to the review, you know, I, I know this exists, but I'm struggling with the concept. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if listeners are as well, the concept okay. of a trick-taking co-op. I mean, nope. trick-taking is competitive. That's what it is. <laughs> nope. It's, it's trying to figure out who is going to take it because we want to move it towards me. So you want to throw that trick to me. So if you're looking at the board, you're like, there's three gems towards me and there's none behind. You're like, I know I need Mo to win. So I'm going to throw this trick to make sure he wins it. And then all of a sudden we go too far and we're way too far. It's like, Oh geez. And then you got to figure out, oh, does he want to go one back to grab those two gems or is it time to swing back to my end? And then there's all the card counting because uh, part of the way it works is the higher number cards and the lowest, the highest and the lowest cards move you the furthest. Right. So, so the eight and the two are two of the cards that move, or sorry, no, it's the 10 and the two, both move you three spots. And this track only has, what is it? I, I'd never actually, I didn't count them. I'm only going to guess about 11 spots on it. I'd have to bring up a picture of it. And then, and I think it's 12 spots on the, on the hard side, on the easy side and 11 on the other. So it's a lot of trying to figure out what you're what, what who's doing what like what your opponent's thinking and trying to do some card counting it, it's definitely a, a unique way to think of it yeah 11, now my 11 is what i see on on the, on 11? the one picture okay. and you start basically in the middle so once you start leaning towards one way it's hard to go back sometimes and you right. basically have to throw a trick to go back the other way and like we tried a few strategies we tried trying to like just one, two, three it and try to grab every one. And we found overall, we seem to do way better by like running down one end of the path and running back the other way and then running back and then running back and then trying to pick up the ones that are left seem to go a little better for us. But uh, there definitely are different strategies. Oh, so the B side actually has one less space. Yes. Yeah. But it also has different symbols on the spaces. It's how many gems. So ah. if you're playing on easy, you play on the A side. If you're playing on medium, you play on the B side and you're filling gems where there's squares. If you play on hard, you also fill where there's diamonds. Okay. So it's just how many gems you're trying to collect. Now, what I did not like about this game are those communication rules. Like, I get it. Like, the game wouldn't work if you could talk. Like, it, it'd just be too easy. It'd be like, well, we got to come back this way, obviously, so you have to lose this trick. Here, I played an eight. Like, it, it just wouldn't work. Like, it, it wouldn't work as a game. Like, it'd just be too simple. So, I get it. You have to restrict communication. If you, if you were allowed to talk, it just wouldn't work. But the thing is, I play two-player games with Deanna, and this is the kind of game we would break out on a date night, right? Whether we're at home or at a pub or at a cafe, we're going out. And, like, on a date night, I want to interact with my date. I want to sit and chat with my wife and have fun while playing. I don't want to sit in silence playing cards and moving little things and maybe going, oh... Like that's a, even going, oh, you're giving something away where you're like, oh, you obviously didn't expect me to play that. Right. So, yes, you could talk about other things like we could be like, oh, so what'd you do on the weekend? Are you liking Vikings on Netflix? Should we watch the next season? Whatever. But the problem is this is a thinky game like this is a heavier game and it's rather engaging. So you can't really talk about other things because if you're talking about other things, you're distracting the player because there's no time where you're both not playing. So. Like, I get it. It's a great for a strategy game. And, and I get why it works. And I got to say, it's a great mechanic, but it is not a date night game. Like, it, it, it that is what bothers me about the game. Like, it sounds like a duet. We're going to play together. We're going to have a great night together playing this game and beating it together. But we're not really doing it. We're doing it yeah. together in silence. It almost seems like a great game to play on a card table in front of you while you sit and watch Netflix. <laughs> maybe so so you're you're not going to be talking because you're watching netflix and you just have to be playing a game as well you have but even then you're going to get distracted and like oh shoot did she play a four already or not there, like ah oh, it just there's so much fo focus to it like like i i don't know this this one's not going on my two-player games for gate night list which is our most popular post it, it doesn't belong there but 
it's a great game. Like if you're into playing two player games and cooperative games and strategy games, like I have a feeling war gamers might like this, like Tex encounter trying to get in each other's brains and who's going to flank who I think they might dig this game for the way you have to think of the way the mechanics work. What's the play time on this? Less than half an hour. Okay. Like, like, like 20, 20 minutes to half an hour, depending on how quick you play, how much AP there is. So it could almost, I mean, as, as part of the date night thing, that's not the end of the world if you wanted to have, you know, hey, maybe when you're, you know, you're still both sober and, you know, have a, a, a good thinky, quiet yeah. game to sort of get into a headspace and, and clear out the, the stress of the week before you and then, you know, move on to other games where you're, you're, you are talking and, and doing things. Yeah, I could see it, but personally, I would rather play a game where like where, where there's smack talk right like oh i got you with this one like you just want to be able to it's a right. trick-taking game like i want to be like ha i've got trump you know right. like just that to me is that's that's more enjoyable it's more fun yeah so he's saying fox in the forest not duet <laughs> basically yeah although to be fair not all couples are maybe as competitive on date night as you would uh, be possibly <laughs> Well, we looked for something co-op. Like, so, you know what? Like, here, to compare the two, right? So, obviously, the, the big difference between the Fox and the Forest and the Fox and Forest duet is Fox and the Forest is competitive, duet's cooperative. Like, that that alone is going to make players like one version or the other. Like, if you're looking to decide, what should, which should I buy? I, if you want a cooperative game, buy duet. If you want a competitive game, buy Fox and the Forest. That's pretty simple. What I found is that Fox and the Forest is definitely easier. To, to teach, to play, to get playing, to break it out. There's less tokens. There's less bits. And it's just it, a quicker get it to the table game. Duet's definitely more fiddly. Like you've got a board, right? And there's difficulty levels and you got little chips you got to put out. Now it's not hard to learn, but it's definitely harder than Fox in the Forest. And then there's a bit more learning curve to Duet too. Like I, I, I don't know the board game geek ranks, but I have to assume Duet's higher. Like, there's definitely more strategy required to be able to play it. There's more to think about. And there's more variables in play each turn. Right. And what I found is I would say Fox in the Forest Duet is the more strategic, the more tactical, the better game, like the better designed game, the better gamer's game. But it's just so much less social. Like, because of that, Duet is, you're going to be played in silence, trying to sync up, right? Whereas... Every game we play is almost silent, whereas Fox in the Forest, we're vocal and interacting, right? And the way I think of it, and I, th this isn't to say that Duet's bad or Fox in the Forest is bad. It's Duet is the better game. It's a better design game. It's a better, more engaging game. But Fox in the Forest is more fun, right? Like, like if, if your your goal is not always have fun when playing a board game, well, or like, like fun in that, yeah, it's fun, laughy kind of way versus it's challenging you mentally and it's rewarding when you win, right? Like, I, yeah. I, I, I hate to say it, but that's just the way I think of it. I'm like, Duet is a better game. Fox in the Forest is more fun. Fair. Now, in the end, I actually enjoy both. I would be happy to own both. Uh, to me, each game fills a different niche and each niche is something I'm willing to play depending on the mood I'm in. If it's just me and my wife and we're going to have a couple drinks and want to play a card game, I'm going to grab Fox in the Forest. But if what we're craving is more of a puzzle and a challenge to overcome and work together the beat, then I would grab Duet. Of the two, I would rather have the Fox in the Forest in my, my permanent collection, just because I think it's going to come up more often that I want to play that game. But I see no reason to pick one over the other. But if you definitely prefer one style of game or the other, that's those are the two choices. All right. Well, for a slightly more in-depth look at the Fox in the Forest Duet, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Hi, every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. So there's a few, quite a bit this last week that we actually had some gaming in. We had, we had some gaming time this week, so we got lots to cover here. So... Last week, one of the things we did is uh, we finished up a couple digital games. Uh, we're not going to get into huge details here because we've talked about most of our digital plays quite a bit. There was more Seven Wonders, a couple games of Terra Mystica. Uh, the games of Terra Mystica were interesting because one was on Board Game Arena, one was on Yukata. And I think it's worth noting another beef about Yukata. Um, Boshan and I were noting we did kind of prefer Terra Mystica on there for some reasons. 
But man, I had no clue the game ended. Like I just thought someone still hadn't taken their turn until we were hanging out and Deanna's like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I won that game of Terra Mystica. And I'm like, wait, what? What game you won? Like I have notifications turned on and I get emailed when it's my turn, but there was nothing telling me that game ended. Like I actually thought I might've won that game. And I was like, I would love to know what I did wrong that Deanna won. And I couldn't even figure out where to find that information to see what our final scores were. Now, we did dig around a little bit last night online while we were uh, killing some time, and we did find the end state of Terra Mystica and, and the, the breakdown of the scoring. But we noticed that Igizia, yeah. they actually reset. So when you click on the game uh, the, the, in, in your list of, of previous games, they bring up Terra Mystica brings up the end state and the scoring. But mm -hmm. when you click on Agizia, it actually reverts to the beginning of the game before the first play. Yeah. And you have to click through all of the turns to get to the end in order to see the scoring. So, there, I mean, even again, between games, there is no consistency, which is one of the no. complaints we had when we were talking about uh, Yukata, Yukata the first time. Yeah, so I, you know what? I, like, I know we both kind of preferred ter playing Terra Mystica on BGA, but just the way, like, even just once we did see how Terra Mystica ended, it was not clear. Whereas you can go on BGA and replay last turn, and you can hit a button and watch it play through and score everything one by one and clearly see yeah. where people got their points from. Instead of just, like, basically a big text list on the right-hand side of the page that says everything that happened, I... I was really disappointed by that. Like that, like my opinion of uh, Yukata dropped a bit after those two games ended. Yep. Now up next, um, we're going to go chronological. I did get a handful of games of Fox in the forest duet in with Deanna. Uh, we just reviewed that one. So I won't go into detail. Uh, this is a great two player game with a lot going on, but take some focus to do well. We both really enjoyed it. And what's interesting here, you've already heard my full review at this point. We were ready to go after the like our first three plays. We're like that's it. This is better than Fox in the Forest. This is a better game. This wins. This was. We're sitting now. And we're going to learn this game. We're going to play it. But a bit more about why we changed our mind in a bit. And next then there was up, a big night. Yeah, next up was Sunday night. Uh, Deanna and I had a stay at home date night. We had some uh, local charcuterie, lots of craft beers. I do want to give a couple props in case there's some Windsor people listening here that the Cheese Bar in Emeryville has been fantastic. Uh, they do drop off at the door. Sarah is the owner there. They are stocking so much great local stuff. They've got meats, cheeses, uh, breads, banana. They, they gave us raw banana bread we just had to cook, as well as carrying Ontario craft beer to deliver right to your door. Um, the other one I do is I want to highlight Brewer Eats because while the Cheese Bar does have some local breweries, they're highlighting one brewery a week and they don't have a large selection. Deanna managed to find something called Brewer Eats. So you think like Uber Eats, but Brewer Eats. They are from somewhere out in Toronto, willing to deliver to Ontario, where you buy beers 24 at a time. And they have, I don't know, a, a good two dozen or a dozen different breweries to pick from. So we got a two four of beers from a dozen different breweries to try out. And those all showed up. So no, we didn't drink two four beers on Sunday night, but... We've got an anniversary in two weeks, and we'll polish off the rest then, maybe. So, yeah, big shout out to Cheese Bar in Emeryville and uh, Brewer Eats for being able to supply the food and drink for the night. On to the games. First thing was a game. This is off the pile of shame. Kickstarted in 2017, never got it to the table, and this is unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. This is a game you play while doing a beer tasting. Now... The first time we were going to play this because we wanted to try it out didn't work great because we kind of knew what beers we were drinking already. Because part of the thing was we had grabbed four different, we have, we have a tasting set and it has four different types of beer glasses, which are for four different styles of beer. So we tried to find those four different styles of beer to be able to have them right. So it wasn't the best thing to do, best choice, but I kind of wanted to try the mechanics. I wanted to try the game. So like, I'm like, I, you know what? I had a vague idea. Deanna had a pretty good idea what the beers were. I was like, I know this one's an IPA, but I don't know exactly what type. So it was, it was our first time. So we went with it. So sometimes you just do what you need to do to get a game to the table, even if it's, uh, you know, not necessarily going to be the most challenging game. Yeah. Well, I say it was, it was try it. So, so the game has written has this big board with a bunch of different spots on it, right? The place, and you get a you get a little wooden task that you put on. And you're going to pick an area of the board to push your ke keg 
to, to where you think this beer fits. So there's one point areas that are the fermenter, fermentation type where you're, is it a lager or an ale? Your choice. There's another side that has the alcohol content and it's broken up into four categories. You're just like, I don't know what beer this is, but you know what? This is an American beer. It's probably a 4.5%. I'm going to bet on that. That's, that's the basic bet. Or you can go up to the next, which is the style where you're just going like lager, ale, pale ale, like really broad stout, right? Like not, not very specific. And if you happen to get that right, you get two points. Now, if you're not sure on that, if you if you you know it, you're like, oh, you know what? This is not just an India Pale Ale. This isn't an IPA. This is an American Pale Ale. This is an APA. Or you know, this isn't just an Amber. This is a Royal Amber Lager. You can go down to that minutia, right? And if you get that right, it's worth three points. And then finally, there's the I know what beer this is, and you just throw your barrel in the middle of the board. And if you get it right, it's worth five points. And that's it. You then you place your thing. Then you reveal what the beer is, and you score points if you're right. No points if you're wrong. So. A lot like a betting on a roulette or a craps table. Yeah, exactly. The the, the, the more minutia you get down, the more points you get if you're right. I, and to be honest, that's not much fun. It just isn't. It's just not that great. Because, I don't know, when I heard about this game, when it backed on Kickstarter, I just expected more. And the problem I see with this game is, is the fact you only get the one bet. What I want to do is I want to look at the board and I want to bet on all those things. I want to guess what alcohol it is. I want to guess what type of fermentation it is. I want to guess what generic type it is. And I want to drill it down to what specific type it is. And the other one that's just oddly missing from the board is the IBUs. IBUs are international bitterness units. You can tell them a bit of a beer snob. How the heck in today's craft beer society do they not have bitterness rated on there? Because that's like everyone. That's all they care about is how bitter their beer is. Like how is that not even on the board? Like I want to bet on those five things. And I want to get points for which ones I'm right on. The problem with the style now is like you just you either know it or you don't and you get points or you don't. It's win or lose. Whereas the way I'd play it, it'd be like, well, at least I got the ABV right and I got the IBUs right. No, I didn't get the beer right. And I get some points. I get something. I had some interaction. Now it's like I know it or I don't. And that's it. I just think it'd be a way better game. So that's what we did is we played the first round with their rules. And I threw that out because it plays like up to six players. We just took all the player pieces and we made multiple bets. And that did make the game much more enjoyable. So, yeah, I wonder, you know, regardless of the rules, would their mechanic be more enjoyable with more players? I don't think so. Like, it'd just be more people placing one bet. Right. And basically, I think the person who knows the beers the best is going to win every time, which is, I guess, part of the goal. But it'd be nice to get rewarded for, like, the lucky guess. Like, oh, this at least, like, it's one of those, like, this tastes boozy, so I'm going to guess it has a strong alcohol content. Even if you're not a beer taste through tries lots of beer you're going to get some points right there's some reward there whereas the person who knows the beer is going to be like no no that's a russian pale ale done i he gets six and despite that the other person gets nothing because i don't know it just it, it just feels like there could be more to it so this was the start of the night we're eating and doing this I, like i wasn't going to break out a real board game at this point uh but later in the night we came back after we were we we uh had finished eating we had actually started playing another game, which I'll talk about separate. We were playing playing um, Coimbra, and between our between eras in Coimbra, because you play four eras, we went over and read review a beer. And this time, we did the whole blind thing, and that made the game so much more fun. Like, it, it's surprising that you can reach into a fridge and cover up the label of a beer without really knowing at all what you've grabbed. It's, it's kind of, when you don't know the beers. Like, it, it's only really worked because we bought 24 beers from 12 breweries we'd never had before. I'm sure I'd recognize, like, a Coors Light can, but I'm like, I don't know, it's blue, right? Like, I'm grabbing, I'm like, it's blue, I crack it open, I pour two glasses of blue, and then I literally would put it in this tub where I couldn't see it, then walk out with both glasses, D and I would play. We Then I'd go grab the can from the other room, and we'd look and see how we did. That was actually a lot of fun. So that's, I'm like, okay, this game's cool. Like that, that was fun with the full rules, not with the one bet with the, with the full, we bet on multiple things. So regardless of the rules, it really does seem like it would benefit from being a hosted game uh, yes. with, with a group of, play, uh, a group of, of players, probably all with at least some beer knowledge to, to make it a little more, more interesting rather than having that one person who's just kind of randomly guessing because they yeah. think it. But I'd say, I think the perfect way to play this would be, Hey, you know what, Charles or other other people who drink beer, come on over tonight, bring four beers. I'll bring four beers. You bring four beers. I'll put out the tasting glasses. And then this round I run and I'm going to go in the, I'm going to go in the other room. So you don't see it. I'm going to pour my four beers and I'm going to bring them out to you guys. And I'm going to sit back and watch while you bet. And then I'm going to tell you that's this beer and I'll give you some background, right? Like make it, make it a, make it a educational, right? There's a beer that's brewed in the Muskoka region and blah, blah, blah. And this is why it tastes like this. And this is why it falls into this category. 
all right, now it's Mo's turn. And then Mo pours all the beers and then you do a round. And then yeah. Sean's turn and he pours all the beers and you do a round. I think that is the way to do it. Though I got to say, I'm tempted to remake this game myself. Like, I, I don't want to copy it. I just want to do it right. <laughs> like, it just, like, it's got to have IBUs. Like, how is there no IBUs? And I got to say, there were some definite styles of beer that were missing. Like, some of my favorite beers is a milk stout. There's no milk stout on that board. How is there no milk stout? Like, does this person live in an area of the world where there are no milk stouts? Our favorite beer from Banda Goose Brewery is, is a milkshake IPA. No, no milkshake IPAs. Or even more popular, doesn't everyone like coffee porters? How is coffee porter not on the board? Like, it's not an option. Right. So, I, like, I, I do. I, I Like, I feel bad for the person who kickstarted this in a way. I paid him. I guess I couldn't be that bad. Um, but I want to take his game and fix it. <laughs> like, right. I, I don't know. I, like, I'm actually, like, Deanna and I are talking about it. This might become a thing. I'm a tabletop bellhop. May put out a, a board game about rating beers done right, where you, you, you vote on a bunch of different categories. All right. All right. So... As for back to board games, enough about the beers. Um, we played our first game of Coimbra. Uh, two players, obviously, just the two of us. Uh, this was early in the night still, right? We're, they, we're just having tasters, right? These are not, we have not at this point had four beers. We've tasted four beers. Uh, everything had kicked in. Um, we were playing and labeled at the same time. I have heard really good stuff about Coimbra. So far, it lives up to hype. I was impressed by what I saw. Um, I know there's some kind of broken strategy out there. I don't want to know about it. Don't look it up. Don't tell me. I, I remember it's based on one of the colors of the dice, but I don't know what it was. We didn't see it. Uh, and I'd rather discover it on my own. So I don't know. What, I want to know what it is, but we didn't see it in one game. Yeah. For those interested, we have talked about it. The, the arguably broken aspect before in a previous episode. Uh, I just honestly can't recall if it was during the podcast or in patron audio, but we've already discussed it. So yeah, can go back and find it. And I thankfully don't remember what it was. So, <laughs> which is good. Now, this is one I, I don't owe anyone a review. I bought or I got this game as a gift, actually, but it, it's my copy. It, this is something we, we don't owe anyone, but I'll probably do up a review because I like writing reviews. So I'll keep this short. This is a dice drafting game. Uh, you're going to play your dice into the various spots on the board to be able to recruit people. The people come in four different colors. Uh, you pay with them from one or two resources as coins or guards. The four different people represent four different tracks on the board. And for everyone you recruit, you go up on those tracks. So that's part of the game is the tracks. Um, then there's uh, the neat part with the dice is the number of the die you use determines who gets to pick which card first, but it's also how much you pay. So I thought that was kind of brilliant. So like if you want to play a five, because you want to go first to make sure you get that person, or you're going to have to pay five gold or five guards to get them which is kind of neat but then the color of the die matters when you get to the income phase and that goes back to those four tracks where you only make money off the tracks or well resources i shouldn't say money you only make coins guards points or pilgrims based on what color of the die you use so i thought that it, it was just a neat like what you're drafting the dice for and stuff is really well done that's really really neat um there's a whole thing with pilgrims where you're moving around the board and founding monasteries to give you bonus powers that's it, it it's a a neat other touch, so you're drafting these people and moving around the countryside founding monasteries using dice. It's really neat. It's, it's really well done. Uh, there's also a thing where you can send expeditions to distant lands at the end of every turn for end game story. Uh, it's a heavier game. Uh, it's the kind Deanna and I usually love, and we really liked the first game we played. Well, it's a nice, uh, solid 3.5-ish weight rating from yep. BGG for those who are interested. Yeah, it seems a little high for the. It didn't seem that difficult, but you know what? Some of the AP levels high. Uh, and it's that, not quite three five. It's yeah. I, yeah I, it's I've been there. rounding off more often than not on BGG Fair enough. because really, within a half a point, it's kind of point. It's meaningless. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, one heads up that totally tripped us up. If you buy the Canadian printing from Eggert Spiel, it includes both Canadian and French versions of English all the cards that have text. Huh? English and French. They're both Canadian. English Oh, Canadian and French. Sorry, Canadian <laughs> and French. Yeah, whoa, no. That, that was rude. I, I didn't mean that, French listeners. <laughs> English and French, yes. Sorry, it has English and French versions of all the cards that have text on them. Now, that's only about eight of the cards, and there's a lot of cards, 48 cards. But, though where does it tell you this? Like, the, it's not on the box. It's not in the rules. Like, I went looking for it. So what happened to us is I just shuffled them in with everything else. And then the first time I'm playing, putting out the cards, I saw two French cards. And I'm like, I even tweeted it. I'm like, ooh, looks like we got a French copy of Coimbra. Wow. Okay. But the rule book had a summary of all the cards. So like, well, we can play it. That's fine. But then the next round, I put out someone, and I'm like, wait a minute. That's the same card. 
And I grabbed it, and sure enough, it's the same card, and I was pretty sure that every citizen was unique. So then I went through, and I'm like, wait a minute, there are duplicates of all of the cards with text in English and French. There, I got to write that down, in English and French. So just a heads up, if you pick up an English version of Coimbra, you need to take out one language or the other, or else you'll have way too many cards, and the game will never end. No. Yeah. And I guess, like, thumbs up for including both. Like, that's cool. Just total surprise. Uh, so we played the one game of Coimbra. We weren't really feeling it to play a second game of Coimbra, plus more beer was flowing. So we switched up to lighter stuff. So first, we picked up Fox in the Forest Duet. And this is where I get back to what I hinted at earlier. This is where we realized this game is not good for drinking night or date night. Yes, it's cooperative, but the fact you can't talk to each other really makes it terrible for when you want to have a social evening. Uh, so as I know during the review segment, it doesn't help that this is also pretty thinky and requires focus, which is great for a strategy game, but not so great for date night. I suppose some people might argue that a silent date night has its place, but perhaps only when planned that way. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. It may be for some people. For us, it, it, it was it like crashed and burned. Like, it was just not fun at this point. We're like, no, this isn't fun. So we're like, all right, this wasn't fun. What about the original Fox and Forest? Let's break that out. And sure enough, this was great. This was a better choice. Uh, it played solidly. Um, we already knew how to play, right? So it was just, this is great. I Literally, I got to bring this. I got to pick up a copy. I need to get Fox in the Forest. This was a perfect date night, drinking, let loose, have fun night, quick to play, easy. Like, I want to pack this in our in our milk crate of we bring it when we go to Kingsville. You know, I'll have the Duke, Onitama, Patchwork, War Chest, and the Fox in the Forest all ready to go. Interesting to note that Azul is no longer on that travel list. Oh, my, if the Anna wants me to bring it, I got to admit, I got I got a, a little burned out on Azul. I like it, but... We went I, long and hard on Azul for, for quite did, a while. We did, for a long time. Uh, Onitama should probably drop off that list. I don't remember the last time we actually played Onitama. I pack it, and then we never play it. And it's not that it's a bad game. It's just the other stuff catches my attention more. All right, then we finished off the night uh, with a couple two-player games of Medium. Uh, this was our first time trying two-player, and I got to say it worked better than I thought it would. It's long, though. Like, like medium always surprises me when playing multiplayer. So you only actually get to go, like, two or three times. But two players, like, we played, I don't know, seven, eight rounds. Like, because you uh, shuffle three decks together when playing two players. And it takes a while to hit those crystal balls in the bottom deck. So it's it, it was a lot more rounds of the game than I thought it would be. And I got to say, it was more fun than either of us expected. I will admit, we were feeling pretty good at this point. Uh, the only problem with medium at that point is we were having a bit too much fun. We're a little too loud and woke up both our kids, which put an end to that date night or date morning as the case happened to be at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a little, <laughs> just a little. So up next, uh, fully recovered Tuesday night. Uh, we did have another game with a patron, uh, with John Carney. We played another round of terraforming Mars on steam. Uh, he's one of our This Chairs for You patrons, which we have more chairs available if you are interested. Uh, this was a solid game. I think it went a lot better than our first game we played the other day. I don't know. We just seemed to be, it flowed better. We seemed to have the influence, the interface down a little more. The time between turns seemed to be quicker. But man, was it a long game, like four and a half hours. And I think it was just the cards we were dealt. Like it just took our engines just couldn't get going. We weren't going anywhere. Yeah, we weren't I mean, you had a couple of really great opening hand cards. I had one, but I couldn't really convert it into anything. And while I'm much happier about how I played this game, uh, which yeah. admittedly wasn't hard, it, uh, it, it really did go. I mean, it was a long game. It was, it was long. And but Deanna completely... Deanna completely kicked our butts this time. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how, though. So that was my one complaint, is at the end, there's just, it's the Steam interface. Everything's hidden. Like, so you can see the board. Like, you have to click, like, 20 different spots to see all the different things. And there's just so much stuff that you wouldn't see if you don't click in the right spot. So it's like, I had to click on D and click here and click here. Like, I have no idea how she beat me that badly. Like, I know she had me on milestones, and that's yeah. fine. And milestones and awards. But that, like, I, I accounted for that. But And I know she had some in-game victory points because they showed, like, I don't even know. Like, there's about 15 points that I have no clue where they came from, which wouldn't have won me the game. Like, that wouldn't have swung it. But it was still the beat me by that one. I'm like, where, where did those 15? I don't even know. Yeah, no, it's definitely 
it, it plays more like a sort of a Euro group solitaire game on yeah. on Steam because you, they're just it's so hard to see the other play people's stuff, both their like player boards, cards, whatever. It's just hard to see it. So you end up mostly just Missing. focusing on your own game and other players can get away with stuff that way. Uh, overall, still dig it. Uh, Terraforming Mars, it's fun. Uh, I love Terraforming Mars. This is a good implementation, though. Man, I'm wishing they had Prelude. Like, I just I want that jump start, especially after this game. Like, it just took a while. Um, one other thing I do want to call out, just a, a non gaming shout out here, is to Soma FM, which is something Sean's found. He's probably listening to it right now. Uh, all of us had Soma FN on on the '80s Underground station, all at the same time. So despite being in separate places like Windsor, Texas, and Hamilton, we were all listening to the same tunes. So that was that was actually that actually in, in, enhanced the uh, the experience of all all having the same music on and commenting now and then about what songs were playing in that. So that is a great way to listen to music free online. Yeah, I've been using Soma FM for quite some while, quite a while now, and I am planning on donating. They do it; they are free. But you know, are always looking for donations, uh, and and it's one of those things that's in my list of of places I have to give money when when money's flowing a little better. Yeah. Uh, and and yes, I am listening to Underground Eighties right now. There you go. See. All right. Final final game of the week today was earlier today two games of the same game, and that is Arboretum. So this was part of Renegade Game Studios Worldwide Game Day. Uh, first off, Terry Latorco lent to us her deluxe edition, which is pretty cool. Cause man, is that a beautiful looking game? Like Arboretum already had nice art, looked pretty, but like this wooden, it's like a wooden box. It's laser etched with the, the, the logo and, and it's got an embossed tree on the front. I can't remember the name of the purple tree, but it's a very beautiful purple tree. And the art on the cards is nice and everything's, um, holographic, which I, I, the holographic I'm so, so on, to be honest, it, it they're shiny cards. But it also includes a, a, a felt light insert, but also a drawstring bag, which I thought was a nice touch. So you get this like nice fancy wooden box for putting on your shelf. But like when you just want to go to the coffee shop and play, you can just throw the cards in the drawstring bag. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice touch. As for the game, uh, it played pretty well. Uh, we played two rounds. The global event, holy cow. So part of these events is Renegade Games throws out a global event. And then they usually do them every so many minutes to change the game slightly. They did two global events for the entire game that just drastically changed how the game played. I'm like, wow, you really messed with Arboretum. But for one, they made one of the suits wild, and then they decided one of the other suits you're going to score no matter what. And the problem is I totally forgot about that second one by the end of the game, and that more than cost me the game. Uh, Arboretum's a f the, probably the most brain-burning traditional-style card game I've ever played. For that, you know, you shuffle the, I don't know, it's not even that traditional, but you're going to draw so many cards, you're going to discard cards, you're going to play in your tableau, and you're trying to place the cards in order, and you're trying to get the same suits next to each other, but it doesn't even actually matter if the same suits, and you get bonus points if you started at one and then at eight, but then you only get to score the ones that you have the most of in your hand at the end of the game. Like, there's just a lot going on an arboretum and i noticed in our chat we had a couple people that were questioning multiple things during it and we're just like wow that's a lot to think about it is it is it is a heavy brain burning card game um plays up to four players i saw no problems playing at two i had never played at two players all my previous games were at four played great at two players uh as deanna mentioned man the ap trying to track what four players are doing could be pretty rough in that game uh it's been a long time since i played my copy so i couldn't remember how bad it was but we had fun we played two games uh i think sean's gonna have it edited and live tomorrow on youtube if not it'll be next thursday but whichever i just have to make sure i find the f-bombs and uh, edit those out yes that that was the only problem with our live stream is for uh for renegade game's sake we try to keep things pg and there were a couple mistakes the enemy that got her a little upset and her uh, language actually, and actually up he's got a point there i mean the the first the all the events were in that first game do we want to just edit out edit it down to that first play i know she we could. I, know, I know there's other reasons she wants to cut out the second play yeah but it actually does kind of make sense perhaps it's a, we could do that i had almost thought I'd cut the first play out but just because the just because we kept i kept adjusting the camera because i couldn't find i didn't realize how much room we were going to take yeah, up and i, I kept moving it that. back and moving it back and moving it whereas the second one i kept the standard camera angle for the whole thing so i thought maybe just keep the second round but then yeah deanna did make some mistakes not just in language, but she <laughs> forgot to play a couple times and stuff. Yeah. 
It was odd. Her first round definitely went better than the other. But overall, I dig Arboretum. I don't know if I'll do a full review on it or not. I've owned the game for a long time. feels weird doing a review for a game that I've owned since the first printing of it. It might happen. If I run out of review content, maybe we'll do a bit more with it. I think Deanna wants to play some more, which is interesting because I've owned the original and I could never get it to the table before. So I just needed Renegade Games. That's what you need to do. You need to look at my collection and find the games that have been sitting there forever I never got D to play and be like, here, we're going to have a game day. You can start doing other companies too. That's fine. <laughs> so that's it. A lot of games. It was, it, was a, it was a good week for gaming for a change. I told you at some point, Deanna and I were going to sit down and play some two-player games. It happened. We got a bunch of games played. All righty. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. So the big thing I want to get to is some unboxings. Um, I've got something behind me. I don't even know what it is. I'm assuming there's some games in there I'm going to have to unbox. And I'm really itching to at least look at my copy of Eclipse. Earlier during our AMA, someone was asking about Kickstarters you've lost interest in. That hasn't happened. This is the opposite. I want to play my copy of Eclipse. I really don't think Eclipse is going to be two-player. But, man, I'm, I'm itching to see what's in that box. Or boxes, because there's literally two boxes. So I want to do that. Um, the reasons I wasn't doing um, unboxings have started to clear up, to put it that way. Um, I'm thinking I'll probably do a bunch in a row, because that's what I tend to do is do, you know, three to six in a row. So don't I'm go, thinking don't I might do more do... than five. Don't do six. Don't you say it's five <laughs> limit? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 by five, you, 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 you definitely are tiring. Um, All right. It's, it's just, it's just. There's a noticeable difference after a certain right. number. So, or even take do three and take a break and do three take more break. or something. But I, there's a definite. If you look at our, uh, if you look at our unboxings, you can tell how, where in the night Mo has done them. Sometimes. There you go. So. See, I would think those are the better ones. I'm more entertaining by that point. No, probably not. That that that, that was that was my my word from the above. But yeah, I'm thinking of doing Concordia Salsa. Although I can't play Concordia two player, so I don't know what I'll unbox. Maybe I'm I'll gonna grab Vikings probably from downstairs. I'm gonna go look for two player games and specifically unbox two player games because there is a chance those will actually get played. So there's that. Um, I want to play War of the Ring. Um, that's another one. I want to play. Um, we talked about some of this during the AMA. Uh, Julius Caesar, because we've been, that one sat on the pile for a long time and we talked about it. And Deanna keeps getting it confused with, um, oh, Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage, which is a game neither of us could figure out from the rule book. So every time I go, well, you want to play Julius Caesar? She's like, ooh, no, she's thinking of that. And I finally figured that out. So now she's willing to give Julius Caesar a try. Right. And she's like, oh, it's more like Hammer of the Scots. Okay, I'll try that. Both of us are scared of that other game. So maybe that was the time, right? Is to go downstairs and sit and try to figure it out. But man, yeah, that rule book is like, I can't figure it out. It, it's got all these special rules that only happen during special certain situations. And there's no pictures in the book. So like, I think the only way I'm going to figure it out is to literally set up the board and put the, you know, units in that spot and go, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Why you can't cross the river at this time. <laughs> But reading it, no, that that, that one's terrible. Uh, do want to play more Coimbra now that now that we got it? Because uh, I will say, during that play, there was an awful lot of, oh, so that's how that works, or oh, I should have saved that resource. So I think another play of that is definitely warranted. Uh, it did play well enough to player. There was there was, you do some weird stuff with fake dice that you put out, but they don't move. Like they're just set for the whole game, taking up a couple spots. So that worked. That's it's more. It's better than some two-player rules I've seen before. I'd love to play it with more people. Maybe sometime we'll be able to play with other people again. <laughs> and because of that, who knows what else? Like, whatever fits in depends how sane the kids are and how things are going with my mom and everything else around anymore yep. to see. when. So many, what it, yeah, so, so many, many variables right now. Yep. All righty. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers who greatly appreciate their support. Graham Barnett. Thanks. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, Goujon. Thanks. William Fisher. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, it means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, remember to also stop by patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and tip your bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. 
Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. on.